I regret exceedingly, said Monsieur Hercule Poirot. He was interrupted, and not rudely interrupted. The interruption was suave, dexterous, persuasive, rather than contradictory. Oh, please don't refuse offhand, Monsieur Poirot. There are grave issues of state. Your cooperation will be appreciated in the highest quarters. You are too kind, Hercule Poirot waved a hand. But I really cannot undertake to do as you ask. At this season of the year, again, Mr. Jesmond interrupted. Christmas time, he said persuasively. An old-fashioned Christmas in the English countryside. Hercule Poirot shivered. The thought of the English countryside at this season of the year did not attract him. A good old-fashioned Christmas, Mr. Jesmond stressed it. Me, I am not an Englishman, said Hercule Poirot. In my country, Christmas, it is for the children. The New Year, that is what we celebrate. Ah, said Mr. Jesmond, but Christmas in England is a great institution, and I assure you, at King's Lacey, you would see it at its best. It's a wonderful old house, you know. Why, one wing of it dates from the 14th century. Again, Poirot shivered. The thought of a 14th century English manor house filled him with apprehension. He had suffered too often in the historic country houses of England. He looked round appreciatively at his comfortable modern flat with its radiators and the latest patent devices for excluding any kind of draught. In the winter, he said firmly, I do not leave London. Well, I don't think you quite appreciate, Monsieur Poirot, what a very serious matter this is. Mr. Jesmond glanced at his companion, and then back at Poirot. Poirot's second visitor had up to now said nothing but a polite and formal, how do you do? He sat now, gazing down at his well-polished shoes, with an air of the utmost dejection on his coffee-coloured face. He was a young man, not more than twenty-three, and he was clearly in a state of complete misery. Yes, yes, said Hercule Poirot, of course the matter is serious, I do appreciate that. His Highness has my heartfelt sympathy. The position is one of the utmost delicacy, said Mr. Jesmond. Poirot transferred his gaze from the young man to his older companion. If one wanted to sum up Mr. Jesmond in a word, the word would have been discretion. Everything about Mr. Jesmond was discreet. His well-cut but inconspicuous clothes, his pleasant, well-bred voice which rarely soared out of an agreeable monotone, his light brown hair just thinning a little at the temples, his pale, serious face. It seemed to Hercule Poirot that he had known not one Mr. Jesmond, but a dozen Mr. Jesmonds in his time, all using sooner or later the same phrase, a position of the utmost delicacy. The police, said Hercule Poirot, can be very discreet, you know. Mr. Jesmond shook his head firmly. Oh, not the police, he said. To recover the, uh, what we want to recover, will almost inevitably invoke taking proceedings in the law courts. And we know so little. We suspect, but we do not know. You have my sympathy, said Hercule Poirot again. If he imagined that his sympathy was going to mean anything to his two visitors, he was wrong. They did not want sympathy. They wanted practical help. Mr. Jesmond began once more to talk about the delights of an English Christmas. It's dying out, you know, he said, the real old-fashioned type of Christmas. People spend it at hotels nowadays. But an English Christmas with all the family gathered round, the children and their stockings, the Christmas tree, the turkey and plum pudding, the crackers, the snowman outside the window. In the interest of exactitude, Hercule Poirot intervened. To make a snowman, one has to have the snow. He remarked severely, one cannot have snow to order, even for an English Christmas. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine at the meteorological office only today, said Mr. Jesmond, and he tells me that it is highly probable that there will be snow this Christmas. It was the wrong thing to have said. Hercule Poirot shuddered more forcefully than ever. Snow in the country, he said. That would be still more abominable. A large, cold, stone manor house... Not at all, said Mr. Jesmond. Things have changed very much in the last ten years or so. Oil-fired central heating. They have oil-fired central heating at King's Lacey? asked Poirot. For the first time he seemed to waver. Mr. Jesmond seized his opportunity. Yes, indeed, he said. 
and a splendid hot water system, radiators in every bedroom, I assure you. My dear Monsieur Poirot, King's Lacey is comfort itself in the winter time. You might even find the house too warm. That is most unlikely, said Hercule Poirot. With practised dexterity, Mr. Jesmond shifted his ground a little. Well, you can appreciate the terrible dilemma we are in, he said in a confidential manner. Hercule Poirot nodded. The problem was indeed not a happy one. A young potentate-to-be, the only son of the ruler of a rich and important native state, had arrived in London a few weeks ago. His country had been passing through a period of restlessness and discontent. Though loyal to the father, whose way of life had remained persistently eastern, popular opinion was somewhat dubious of the younger generation. His follies had been western ones, and as such looked upon with disapproval. Recently, however, his betrothal had been announced. He was to marry a cousin of the same blood, a young woman who, though educated at Cambridge, was careful to display no Western influence in her own country. The wedding day was announced, and the young prince had made a journey to England, bringing with him some of the famous jewels of his house to be reset in appropriate modern settings by Cartier. These had included a very famous ruby, which had been removed from its cumbersome old-fashioned necklace and had been given a new look by the famous jewellers. So far, so good. But after this came the snag. It was not to be supposed that a young man possessed of much wealth and convivial tastes should not commit a few follies of the pleasanter type. As to that, there would have been no censure. Young princes were supposed to amuse themselves in this fashion. For the prince to take the girlfriend of the moment for a walk down Bond Street and bestow upon her an emerald bracelet or a diamond clip as a reward for the pleasure she had afforded him would have been regarded as quite natural and suitable, corresponding, in fact, to the Cadillac cars which his father invariably presented to his favourite dancing girl of the moment. But the prince had been far more indiscreet than that. Flattered by the lady's interest, he had displayed to her the famous ruby in its new setting, and had finally been so unwise as to accede to her request to be allowed to wear it, just for one evening. The sequel was short and sad. The lady had retired from their supper table to powder her nose. Time passed. She did not return. She had left the establishment by another door, and since then had disappeared into space. The important and distressing thing was that the ruby, in its new setting, had disappeared with her. These were the facts that could not possibly be made public without the most dire consequences. The ruby was something more than a ruby. It was a historical possession of great significance, and the circumstances of its disappearance were such that any undue publicity about them might result in the most serious political consequences. Mr. Jesmond was not the man to put these facts into simple language. He wrapped them up, as it were, in a great deal of verbiage. Who exactly Mr. Jesmond was, Hercule Poirot did not know. He had met other Mr. Jesmonds in the course of his career, whether he was connected with the Home Office, the Foreign Secretary, or some other discreet branch of public service, was not specified. He was acting in the interests of the Commonwealth. The ruby must be recovered. Monsieur Poirot, so Mr. Jesmond delicately insisted, was the man to recover it. Perhaps, yes, Hercule Poirot admitted, but you can tell me so little. Suggestion, suspicion, all that is not very much to go upon. Oh, come now, Monsieur Poirot, surely it is not beyond your powers. Ah, come now, I do not always succeed. But this was mock modesty. It was clear enough from Poirot's tone that for him to undertake a mission was almost synonymous with succeeding in it. His Highness is very young, Mr. Jesmond said. It will be sad if his whole life is to be blighted for a mere youthful indiscretion. Poirot looked kindly at the downcast young man. It is the time for follies when one is young, he said encouragingly. And for the ordinary young man it does not matter so much. The good papa, he pays up. The family lawyer, he helps to disentangle the inconvenience. The young man, he learns by experience, and all ends for the best. In a position such as yours, it is hard indeed. You're approaching marriage. But that is it. That is it exactly. For the first time, words poured from the young man. 
You see, she is very serious. She takes life very seriously. She has acquired at Cambridge um, many very serious ideas. There is to be education in my country. There are to be schools. There are to be many things, all in the name of progress, you understand, of democracy. It will not be, she says, like it was in my father's time. Naturally, she knows that I will have diversions in London, but not the scandal. No, no, it is the scandal that matters. You see, it is very, very famous, this ruby. There is a long trail behind it, a history, much bloodshed, many deaths. Deaths? said Hercule Poirot thoughtfully. He looked at Mr. Jesmond. One hopes, he said, it will not come to that. Mr. Jesmond made a peculiar noise, rather like a hen who has decided to lay an egg, and then thought better of it. Oh, no, no, indeed, he said, sounding rather prim. There is no question, I am sure, of anything of that kind. You cannot be sure, said Hercule Poirot. Whoever has the ruby now, there may be others who want to gain possession of it, and who will not stick at a trifle, my friend. Oh, I really don't think, said Mr. Jesmond, sounding more prim than ever, that we need enter into speculation of that kind, quite unprofitable. Me, said Hercule Poirot, suddenly becoming very foreign, me, I explore all the avenues, like the politicians. Mr. Jesmond looked at him doubtfully. Pulling himself together, he said, Well, I can take it that is settled, Monsieur Poirot. You will go to King's Lacey. And uh, how do I explain myself there? asked Hercule Poirot. Mr. Jesmond smiled with confidence. That, I think, can be arranged very easily, he said. I can assure you that it will all seem quite natural. You will find the Laces most charming, delightful people. And you do not deceive me about the oil-fired central heating? No, no, indeed. Mr. Jesmond sounded quite pained. I assure you that you will find every comfort. Tout confort moderne, muttered Poirot to himself reminiscently. Eh bien, he said, I accept. The temperature in the long drawing-room at King's Lacey was a comfortable sixty-eight, as Hercule Poirot sat talking to Mrs. Lacey by one of the big mullioned windows. Mrs. Lacey was engaged in needlework. She was not doing petit point or embroidered flowers upon silk. Instead, she appeared to be engaged in the prosaic task of hemming dishcloths. As she sewed, she talked in a soft, reflective voice that Poirot found very charming. I hope you will enjoy our Christmas party here, Monsieur Poirot. It's only the family, you know. My granddaughter and a grandson, and a friend of his, and Bridget, who's my great-niece, and Diana, who's a cousin, and David Wellin, who is a very old friend. Just a family party. But Edwina Morecambe said that that's what you really wanted to see, an old-fashioned Christmas. Nothing could be more old-fashioned than we are. And my husband, you know, absolutely lives in the past. He likes everything to be just as it was when he was a boy of twelve years old and used to come here for his holidays. She smiled to herself. All the same old things, the Christmas tree and the stockings hung up, and the oyster soup and the turkey, or two turkeys, one boiled and one roast, and the plum pudding with the ring and the bachelor's button and all the rest of it in it. We can't have sixpences nowadays because they're not pure silver any more. But all the old desserts, the Elvis plums and Carlsbad plums and almonds and raisins and crystallized fruit and ginger, dear me, I sound like a catalogue from Fordham and Mason. You arouse my gastronomic juices, madame. <laughs> I expect we'll all have frightful indigestion by tomorrow evening, said Mrs. Lacey. One isn't used to eating so much nowadays, is one? She was interrupted by some loud shouts and whoops of laughter outside the window. She glanced out. I don't know what they're doing out there, playing some game or other, I suppose. I've always been so afraid, you know, that these young people would be bored by our Christmas here, but not at all. It's just the opposite. Now, my own son and daughter and their friends, they used to be rather sophisticated about Christmas, say it was all nonsense and too much fuss, and it would be far better to go out to a hotel somewhere and dance. But the younger generation seemed to find all this terribly attractive. Besides, added Mrs. Lacey practically, Schoolboys and schoolgirls are always hungry, aren't they? I think they must starve them at these schools. After all, one does know children of that age eat about as much as three strong men. Poirot laughed and said, It is most kind of you, and your husband, madame, to include me in this way, in your family party. Oh, we're both delighted, I'm sure, said Mrs. Lacey. And if you find Horace a little gruff, she continued, pay no attention. It's just his manner, you know. 
What her husband, Colonel Lacey, had actually said was, Can't think why you want one of those damn foreigners here cluttering up Christmas. Why can't we have him some other time? Can't stick foreigners. Oh, all right, all right, so Edwina Morecambe wished him on us. What's it got to do with her, I'd like to know? Why doesn't she have him for Christmas? Because you know very well, Mrs. Lacey had said, that Edwina always goes to Claridge's. Her husband had looked at her piercingly and said, Not up to something, are you, Em? Up to something? said Em, opening very blue eyes. Well, of course not. Why should I be? Old Colonel Lacey laughed a deep, rumbling laugh. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past you, Em, he said. When you look your most innocent is when you are up to something. Revolving these things in her mind, Mrs. Lacey went on. Edwina said she thought perhaps you might help us. I'm sure I don't know quite how, but she said that friends of yours had once found you very helpful in, uh, in a case something like ours. I, well, perhaps you don't know what I'm talking about. Poirot looked at her encouragingly. Mrs. Lacey was close on seventy, as upright as a ramrod, with snow-white hair, pink cheeks, blue eyes, a ridiculous nose, and a determined chin. If there is anything I can do, I shall be only too happy to do it, said Poirot. It is, I understand, a rather unfortunate matter of a young girl's infatuation? Mrs. Lacey nodded. Yes, it seems extraordinary that I should, well, want to talk to you about it. After all, you are a perfect stranger. And a foreigner, said Poirot in an understanding manner. Well, yes, said Mrs. Lacey. But perhaps that makes it easier, in a way. Anyhow, Edwina seemed to think you might perhaps know something. How shall I put it? Something useful about this young Desmond Lee Wortley. Poirot paused a moment to admire the ingenuity of Mr. Jesmond and the ease with which he had made use of Lady Morecambe to further his own purposes. He has not, I understand, a very good reputation, this young man, he began delicately. Oh, no, indeed he hasn't. A very bad reputation. But that's no help as far as Sarah is concerned. It's never any good, is it, telling young girls that men have a bad reputation. It, well, it just spurs them on. You are so very right, said Poirot. In my young day, went on Mrs. Lacey, oh dear, that's a very long time ago, we used to be warned, you know, against certain young men, and of course it did heighten one's interest in them. And if one could possibly manage to dance with them, or to be alone with them in a dark conservatory, she laughed. That's why I wouldn't let Horace do any of the things he wanted to do. Tell me, said Poirot, exactly what is it that troubles you? Our son was killed in the war, said Mrs. Lacey. My daughter-in-law died when Sarah was born, so that she has always been with us, and we've brought her up. Perhaps we've brought her up unwisely, I don't know. But we thought we ought always to leave her as free as possible. That is desirable, I think, said Poirot. One cannot go against the spirit of the times. No, said Mrs. Lacey. That's just what I felt about it. And of course girls nowadays do these sorts of things. Poirot looked at her inquiringly. I think th the way one expresses it, said Mrs. Lacey, is that Sarah has got in with what they call the coffee bar set. She won't go to dances, or come out properly, or be a deb, or anything of that kind. Instead, she has two rather unpleasant rooms in Chelsea, down by the river, and wears these funny clothes that they like to wear, and black stockings, or bright green ones. Very thick stockings. So prickly, I always think. And she goes about without washing, or combing her hair. Ça, c'est tout à fait naturel, said Poirot. It is the fashion of the moment. They grow out of it. Well, yes, I know, said Mrs. Lacey. I wouldn't worry about that sort of thing. But, you see, she's taken up with this Desmond Lee Wortley, and he really has a very unsavoury reputation. He lives more or less on well-to-do girls. They seem to go quite mad about him. He very nearly married the Hope Girl, but her people got her made a ward of court or something. And, of course, that's what Horace wants to do. He says he must do it for her protection. But I don't think it's a really good idea. Monsieur Poirot, I mean, they'll just run away together and go to Scotland or Ireland or the Argentine or somewhere and either get married or else live together without getting married. And although it may be contempt of court and all that, well, it isn't really an answer, is it, in the end? Especially if a baby's coming. One has to give in, then, and let them get married. And then, nearly always, it seems to me, after a year or two, there's a divorce. And then the girl comes home, and usually after a year or two she marries someone so nice he's almost dull, and settles down. 
But it's particularly sad, it seems to me, if there is a child. Because it's not the same thing being brought up by a stepfather, however nice. No, I think it's much better if we did as we did in my young days. I mean, the first young man one fell in love with was always someone undesirable. I remember I had a horrible passion for a young man called... Now, what was his name? How strange it is. I can't remember his Christian name at all. Tibbet. That was his surname. Young Tibbet. Of course, my father more or less forbade him the house, but he used to get asked to the same dances, and we used to dance together, and sometimes we'd escape and sit out together, and occasionally friends would arrange picnics to which we both went. Of course, it was all very exciting and forbidden, and one enjoyed it enormously. But one didn't go to the, well, to the lengths that girls go nowadays. And so, after a while, the Mr. Tibbets faded out. And, you know, when I saw him four years later, I was surprised what I ever had seen in him. He seemed to be such a dull young man, flashy, you know, no interesting conversation. One always thinks the days of one's own youth are best, said Poirot somewhat sententiously. I know, said Mrs. Lacey. It's tiresome, isn't it? I mustn't be tiresome. But all the same, I don't want Sarah, who's a dear girl, really, to marry Desmond Lee Wortley. She and David Wellin, who is staying here, were always such friends and so fond of each other, and we did hope, Horace and I, that they would grow up and marry. But, of course, she just finds him dull now, and she's absolutely infatuated with Desmond. I do not quite understand, madame, said Poirot. You have him here now, staying in the house, this Desmond Lee Wortley? Well, that's my doing, said Mrs. Lacey. Horace was all for forbidding her to see him and all that. Of course, in Horace's day, the father or guardian would have called round at the young man's lodgings with a horsewhip. Horace was all for forbidding the fellow the house and forbidding the girl to see him. I told him that was quite the wrong attitude to take. No, I said. Ask him down here. We'll have him down for Christmas with the family party. Of course, my husband said I was mad. But I said... At any rate, dear, let's try it. Let her see him in our atmosphere, in our house, and we'll be very nice to him and very polite, and perhaps then he'll seem less interesting to her. I think, as they say, you have something there, madame, said Poirot. I think your point of view is very wise, wiser than your husband's. Well, I hope it is, said Mrs. Lacey, doubtfully. It doesn't seem to be working much yet, but of course he's only been here a couple of days. A sudden dimple showed in her wrinkled cheek. I'll confess something to you, Monsieur Poirot. I myself can't help liking him. I don't mean I really like him with my mind, but I can feel the charm all right. Oh, yes, I can see what Sarah sees in him. But I'm an old enough woman and have had enough experience to know that he's absolutely no good, even if I do enjoy his company. Though I do think, added Mrs. Lacey rather wistfully, he has some good points. He asked if he might bring his sister here, you know, She's had an operation and was in hospital. He said it was so sad for her being in a nursing home over Christmas, and he wondered if it would be too much trouble if he could bring her with him. He said he'd take all her meals up to her and all that. Well, now, I do think that was rather nice of him, don't you, Monsieur Poirot? It shows a consideration, said Poirot thoughtfully, which seems almost out of character. Oh, I don't know. You can have family affections at the same time as wishing to prey on a rich young girl. Sarah will be very rich, you know. Not only with what we leave her, and of course that won't be very much because most of the money goes with the place to Colin, my grandson, but her mother was a very rich woman, and Sarah will inherit all her money when she's twenty-one. She's only twenty now. No, I do think it was nice of Desmond to mind about his sister, and he didn't pretend she was anything very wonderful or that. She's a shorthand typist, I gather, does secretarial work in London, and he's been as good as his word, and does carry up trays to her. Not all the time, of course, but quite often. So I think he has some nice points. But all the same, said Mrs. Lacey with great decision, I don't want Sarah to marry him. From all I have heard and been told, said Poirot, that would indeed be a disaster. Do you think it would be possible for you to help us in any way? asked Mrs. Lacey. I think it is possible, yes, said Hercule Poirot but I do not wish to promise too much, for the Mr. Desmond Lee Wortleys of this world are clever, madame. But do not despair. One can perhaps do a little something. I shall at any rate put forth my best endeavours, if only in gratitude for your kindness in asking me here for this Christmas festivity. He looked around him. And it cannot be so easy these days to have Christmas festivities. No, indeed, Mrs. Lacey sighed. She leaned forward. Do you know, Monsieur Poirot, 
what I really dream of, what I would love to have. But tell me, madame, I simply long to have a small, modern bungalow. No, perhaps not a bungalow, exactly, but a small, modern, easy-to-run house, built somewhere in the park here, and live in it with an absolute up-to-date kitchen and no long passages. Everything easy and simple. It is a very practical idea, madame. Well, it's not practical for me, said Mrs. Lacey. My husband adores this place. He loves living here. He doesn't mind being slightly uncomfortable. He doesn't mind the inconveniences, and he would hate, simply hate, to live in a small modern house in the park. So you sacrifice yourself to his wishes. Mrs. Lacey drew herself up. I do not consider it a sacrifice, Monsieur Poirot, she said. I married my husband with the wish to make him happy. He has been a good husband to me, and made me very happy all these years, and I wish to give happiness to him. So you will continue to live here, said Poirot. It's not really too uncomfortable, said Mrs. Lacey. No, no, said Poirot hastily. On the contrary, it is most comfortable. Your central heating and your bath water are perfection. We spent a lot of money in making the house comfortable to live in, said Mrs. Lacey. We were able to sell some land, ripe for development, I think they call it. Fortunately, right out of sight of the house, on the other side of the park. Really rather an ugly bit of ground, with no nice view. But we got a very good price for it so that we have been able to have as many improvements as possible. But the service, madame? Oh, well, that presents less difficulty than you might think. Of course, one cannot expect to be looked after and waited upon as one used to be. Different people come in from the village, two women in the morning, another two to cook lunch and wash it up, and different ones again in the evening. There are plenty of people who want to come and work for a few hours a day. Of course, for Christmas, we are very lucky. My dear Mrs. Ross always comes in, Every Christmas, she is a wonderful cook, really first class. She retired about ten years ago, but she comes in to help us in an emergency. Then there is dear Peveril. Your butler? Yes, he is pensioned off and lives in a little house near the lodge. But he's so devoted, and he insists on coming to wait on us at Christmas. Really, I'm terrified, Monsieur Poirot, because he's so old and so shaky that I feel certain that if he carries anything heavy, he will drop it. It's really an agony to watch him, and his heart is not good, and I'm afraid of his doing too much. But it would hurt his feelings dreadfully if I did not let him come. He hems and haws, and makes disapproving noises when he sees the state our silver is in, and within three days of being here, it's all wonderful again. Yes, he is a dear, faithful friend. She smiled at Poirot. So you see, we are all set for a happy Christmas. A white Christmas, too, she added, as she looked out of the window. See, it's beginning to snow. Ah, the children are coming in. You must meet them, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot was introduced with due ceremony. First to Colin and Michael, the schoolboy grandson and his friend. Nice, polite lads of fifteen, one dark, one fair. Then to their cousin Bridget, a black-haired girl of about the same age with enormous vitality. And this is my granddaughter, Sarah, said Mrs. Lacey. Poirot looked with some interest at Sarah, an attractive girl with a mop of red hair. Her manner seemed to him nervy and a trifle defiant, but she showed real affection for her grandmother. And this is Mr. Lee Wortley. Mr. Lee Wortley wore a fisherman's jersey and tight black jeans. His hair was rather long, and it seemed doubtful whether he had shaved that morning. In contrast to him was a young man introduced as David Wellin, who was solid and quiet, with a pleasant smile, and rather obviously addicted to soap and water. There was one other member of the party, a handsome, rather intense-looking girl, who was introduced as Diana Middleton. Tea was brought in, a hearty meal of scones, crumpets, sandwiches, and three kinds of cake. The younger members of the party appreciated the tea. Colonel Lacey came in last, remarking in a non-committal voice, eh? Tea? Oh, yes, tea. He received his cup of tea from his wife's hands, helped himself to two scones, cast a look of aversion at Desmond Lee Wortley, and sat down as far away from him as he could. He was a big man with bushy eyebrows and a red, weather-beaten face. He might have been taken for a farmer rather than the lord of the manor. Started to snow, he said. It's going to be a white Christmas, all right. After tea, the party dispersed. I expect they'll go and play with their tape recorders now, said Mrs. Lacey to Poirot. She looked indulgently after her grandson as he left the room. Her tone was that of one who says, The children are going to play with their toy soldiers. 
They're frightfully technical, of course, she said, and very grand about it all. The boys and Bridget, however, decided to go along to the lake and see if the ice on it was likely to make skating possible. I thought we could have skated on it this morning, said Colin, but old Hodgkin said no. He's always so terribly careful. Come for a walk, David, said Diana Middleton softly. David hesitated for half a moment, his eyes on Sarah's red head. She was standing by Desmond Lee Wortley, her hand on his arm, looking up into his face. All right, said David Wellin. Yes, let's. Diana slipped a quick hand through his arm, and they turned towards the door into the garden. Sarah said, Shall we go too, Desmond? It's fearfully stuffy in the house. Though who wants to walk? said Desmond. I'll get my car out. We'll go along to the speckled boar and have a drink. Sarah hesitated for a moment before saying, Oh, let's go to Market Ledbury, to the White Hart. It's much more fun. Though for all the world she would not have put it into words, Sarah had an instinctive revulsion from going down to the local pub with Desmond. It was somehow not in the tradition of King's Lacey. The women of King's Lacey had never frequented the bar of the speckled boar. She had an obscure feeling that to go there would be to let old Colonel Lacey and his wife down. And why not? Desmond Lee Wortley would have said. For a moment of exasperation, Sarah felt that he ought to know why not. One didn't upset such old darlings as Grandfather and dear old M unless it was necessary. They'd been very sweet, really, letting her lead her own life, not understanding in the least why she wanted to live in Chelsea in the way she did, but accepting it. That was due to M, of course. Grandfather would have kicked up no end of a row. Sarah had no illusions about her grandfather's attitude. It was not his doing that Desmond had been asked to stay at King's Lacey. That was M, and M was a darling, and always had been. When Desmond had gone to fetch his car, Sarah popped her head into the drawing room again. We're going over to Market Ledbury, she said. We thought we'd have a drink there at the White Hart. There was a slight amount of defiance in her voice, but Mrs. Lacey did not seem to notice it. Well, dear, she said, I'm sure that'll be very nice. David and Diana have gone for a walk, I see. I'm so glad. I really think it was a brainwave on my part to ask Diana here. So sad, being left a widow so young, only twenty-two. I do hope she marries again soon. Sarah looked at her sharply. What are you up to, Em? It's my little plan, said Mrs. Lacey gleefully. I think she's just right for David. Of course, I know he was terribly in love with you, Sarah dear, but you'd no use for him and I realize that he isn't your type. But I don't want him to go on being unhappy, and I think Diana will really suit him. What a matchmaker you are, Em, said Sarah. I know, said Mrs. Lacey. Old women always are. Diana's quite keen on him already, I think. Don't you think she'd be just right for him? I shouldn't say so, said Sarah. I think Diana's far too, well, too intense, too serious. I think David would find it terribly boring being married to her. Well, We'll see, said Mrs. Lacey. Anyway, you don't want him, do you, dear? No, indeed, said Sarah very quickly. She added in a sudden rush, You do like Desmond, don't you, Em? I'm sure he's very nice indeed, said Mrs. Lacey. Grandfather doesn't like him, said Sarah. Well, you could hardly expect him to, could you? said Mrs. Lacey reasonably. But I dare say he'll come round when he gets used to the idea. You mustn't rush him, Sarah, dear. Old people are very slow to change their minds, and your grandfather is rather obstinate. I don't care what grandfather thinks or says, said Sarah. I shall get married to Desmond whenever I like. I know, dear, I know, but do try to be realistic about it. Your grandfather could cause a lot of trouble, you know. You're not of age yet. In another year you can do as you please. I expect Horace will have come round long before that. You're on my side, aren't you, darling? said Sarah. She flung her arms round her grandmother's neck and gave her an affectionate kiss. I want you to be happy, said Mrs. Lacey. Ah, there's your young man bringing his car round. You know, I like those very tight trousers these young men wear nowadays. They look so smart. Only, of course, it does accentuate knock knees. Yes, Sarah thought. Desmond had got knock knees. She'd never noticed it before. Go on, dear, enjoy yourself, said Mrs. Lacey. She watched her go out to the car, and then, remembering her foreign guest, she went along to the library. Looking in, however, she saw that Hercule Poirot was taking a pleasant little nap.
and smiling to herself, she went across the hall and out into the kitchen to have a conference with Mrs. Ross. Come on, beautiful, said Desmond. Your family cutting up rough because you're coming out to a pub? Years behind the times here, aren't they? Well, of course they're not making a fuss, said Sarah sharply as she got into the car. What's the idea of having that foreign fellow down? He's a detective, isn't he? What needs detecting here? Oh, he's not here professionally, said Sarah. Edwina Morecambe, my grandmother, asked us to have him. I think he's retired from professional work long ago. Sounds like a broken-down old cab horse, said Desmond. He wanted to see an old-fashioned English Christmas, I believe, said Sarah vaguely. Desmond laughed scornfully. <laughs> Such a lot of tripe, that sort of thing, he said. How you can stand it, I don't know. Sarah's red hair was tossed back, and her aggressive chin shot up. I enjoy it, she said defiantly. You can't, baby. Let's cut the whole thing tomorrow. Go over to Scarborough or somewhere. I couldn't possibly do that. Why not? Well, it would hurt their feelings. Ah, bilge. You know you don't enjoy this childish, sentimental bosh. Well, not really, perhaps, but... Sarah broke off. She realized with a feeling of guilt that she was looking forward a good deal to the Christmas celebration. She enjoyed the whole thing, but she was ashamed to admit that to Desmond. It was not the thing to enjoy Christmas and family life. Just for a moment, she wished that Desmond had not come down here at Christmas time. In fact, she almost wished that Desmond had not come down here at all. It was much more fun seeing Desmond in London than here at home. In the meantime, the boys and Bridget were walking back from the lake, still discussing earnestly the problems of skating. Flecks of snow had been falling, and looking up at the sky, it could be prophesied that before long there was going to be a heavy snowfall. It's going to snow all night, said Colin. Bet you by Christmas morning we have a couple of feet of snow. The prospect was a pleasurable one. Let's make a snowman, said Michael. Good Lord, said Colin. I haven't made a snowman since, well, since I was about four years old. I don't believe it's a bit easy to do, said Bridget. I mean, you have to know how. We might make an effigy of Monsieur Poirot, said Colin. Give it a big black moustache. There's one in the dressing-up box. I don't see, you know, said Michael thoughtfully, how Monsieur Poirot could ever have been a detective. I don't see how he'd ever be able to disguise himself. I know, said Bridget, and one can't imagine him running about with a microscope and looking for clues or measuring footprints. I've got an idea, said Colin. Let's put on a show for him. What do you mean, a show? asked Bridget. Well, arrange a murder for him. What a gorgeous idea, said Bridget. Do you mean a body in the snow, that sort of thing? Yes. It would make him feel at home, wouldn't it? Bridget giggled. I don't know that I'd go as far as that. If it snows, said Colin, we'll have a perfect setting, a body and footprints. We'll have to think that out rather carefully and pinch one of Grandfather's daggers and make some blood. They came to a halt and, oblivious to the rapidly falling snow, entered into an excited discussion. There's a paint box in the old schoolroom. We could mix up some blood. A crimson Lake, I should think. Crimson Lake's a bit too pink, I think, said Bridget. It ought to be a bit browner. Who's going to be the body? asked Michael. I'll be the body, said Bridget quickly. Oh, look here, said Colin. I thought of it. Oh, no, no, said Bridget. It must be me. It's got to be a girl. It's more exciting. Beautiful girl, lying lifeless in the snow. Beautiful girl, ha, <laughs> said Michael in derision. I've got black hair, too, said Bridget. What's that got to do with it? Well, it'll show up so well on the snow, and I shall wear my red pyjamas. If you wear red pyjamas, they won't show the blood stains, said Michael, in a practical manner. But they'd look so effective against the snow, said Bridget. And they've got white facings, you know, so the blood could be on that. Oh, won't it be gorgeous? Do you think he will really be taken in? He will if we do it well enough, said Michael. We'll have just your footprints in the snow, and one other person's going to the body and coming away from it. A man's, of course. He won't want to disturb them, so he won't know that you're not really dead. Well, you don't think, Michael stopped, struck by a sudden idea. The others looked at him. You don't think he'll be annoyed about it? Oh, I shouldn't think so, said Bridget, with facile optimism. I'm sure he'll understand that we've just done it to entertain him. A sort of Christmas treat. 
I don't think we ought to do it on Christmas Day, said Colin reflectively. I don't think Grandfather would like that very much. Boxing Day, then, said Bridget. Boxing Day would be just right, said Michael. And it'll give us more time, too, pursued Bridget. After all, there are a lot of things to arrange. Let's go and have a look at all the props. They hurried into the house. The evening was a busy one. Holly and mistletoe had been brought in in large quantities, and a Christmas tree had been set up at one end of the dining room. Everyone helped to decorate it, to put up the branches of holly behind pictures, and to hang mistletoe in a convenient position in the hall. I had no idea anything so archaic still went on, murmured Desmond to Sarah with a sneer. We've always done it, said Sarah defensively. What a reason. Oh, don't be tiresome, Desmond. I think it's fun. Sarah, my sweet, you can't. Well, not, not really, perhaps, but I do in a way. Who's going to brave the snow and go to midnight mass? asked Mrs. Lacey at twenty minutes to twelve. Not me, said Desmond. Come on, Sarah. With a hand on her arm, he guided her into the library and went over to the record case. There are limits, darling, said Desmond. Midnight mass. Yes, said Sarah. Oh, yes. With a good deal of laughter, donning of coats and stamping of feet, most of the others got off. The two boys, Bridget, David and Diana, set out for the ten minutes' walk to the church through the falling snow. Their laughter died away in the distance. Midnight mass, said Colonel Lacey, snorting. Never went to midnight mass in my young days. Mass, indeed. Popish, that is. Oh, I beg your pardon, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot waved a hand. It is quite all right. Do not mind me. Matins is good enough for anybody, I should say, said the Colonel. Proper Sunday morning service. Hark the herald angels sing, all the good old Christmas hymns, and then back to Christmas dinner. That's right, isn't it, Em? Yes, dear, said Mrs. Lacey. That's what we do. But the young ones enjoy the midnight service, and it's nice, really, that they want to go. Sarah and that fellow don't want to go. Well, there, dear, I think you're wrong, said Mrs. Lacey. Sarah, you know, did want to go, but she didn't like to say so. Beats me why she cares what that fellow's opinion is. Well, she's very young, really said Mrs. Lacey placidly. Are you going to bed, Monsieur Poirot? Good night. I hope you'll sleep well. And you, madame, are you not going to bed yet? Oh, not just yet, said Mrs. Lacey. I've got the stockings to fill, you see. Oh, I know they're all practically grown up, but they do like their stockings. One puts jokes in them, silly little things, but it all makes for a lot of fun. You work very hard to make this a happy house at Christmas time, said Poirot. I honour you. He raised her hand to his lips in a courtly fashion. Mmm, grunted Colonel Lacey as Poirot departed. Flower is all a fellow. Still, he appreciates you. Mrs. Lacey dimpled up at him. Have you noticed, Horace, that I'm standing under the mistletoe? She asked with the demureness of a girl of nineteen. Hercule Poirot entered his bedroom. It was a large room well provided with radiators. As he went over towards the big four-poster bed, he noticed an envelope lying on his pillow. He opened it and drew out a piece of paper. On it was a shakily printed message in capital letters. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. One as wishes you well. Hercule Poirot stared at it. His eyebrows rose. Cryptic, he murmured, and most unexpected. Christmas dinner took place at 2 p.m. and was a feast indeed. Enormous logs crackled merrily in the wide fireplace, and above their crackling rose the babel of many tongues talking together. Oyster soup had been consumed, two enormous turkeys had come and gone, mere carcasses of their former selves. Now the supreme moment. The Christmas pudding was brought in, in state. Old Peveril, his hands and knees shaking with the weakness of eighty years, permitted no one but himself to bear it in. Mrs. Lacey sat, her hands pressed together in nervous apprehension. One Christmas, she felt sure, Peveril would fall down dead. Having either to take the risk of letting him fall down dead, or of hurting his feelings to such an extent that he would probably prefer to be dead than alive, she had so far chosen the former alternative. On a silver dish, the Christmas pudding reposed in its glory. 
a large football of a pudding, a piece of holly stuck in it like a triumphant flag, and glorious flames of blue and red rising around it. There was a cheer and cries of, Ooh, ah! One thing Mrs. Lacey had done prevailed upon Peveril to place the pudding in front of her, so that she could help it rather than hand it in turn round the table. She breathed a sigh of relief as it was deposited safely in front of her. Rapidly the plates were passed round, flames still licking the portions. Wish, Monsieur Poirot, cried Bridget, wish before the flame goes. Quick, grand darling, quick! Mrs. Lacey leant back with a sigh of satisfaction. Operation Pudding had been a success. In front of everyone was a helping with flames still licking it. There was a momentary silence all round the table, as everyone wished hard. There was nobody to notice the rather curious expression on the face of Monsieur Poirot as he surveyed the portion of pudding on his plate. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. What on earth did that sinister warning mean? There could be nothing different about his portion of plum pudding from that of everyone else. Sighing, as he admitted himself baffled, and Hercule Poirot never liked to admit himself baffled, he picked up his spoon and fork. Hard sauce, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot helped himself appreciatively to hard sauce. Swiped my best brandy again, eh, am? said the Colonel good-humouredly from the other end of the table. Mrs. Lacey twinkled at him. Mrs. Ross insists on having the best brandy, dear, she said. She says it makes all the difference. Well, well, said Colonel Lacey. Christmas comes but once a year, and Mrs. Ross is a great woman, a great woman, and a great cook. She is indeed, said Colin, smashing plum pudding this. Mmm! He filled an appreciative mouth. Gently, almost gingerly, Hercule Poirot attacked his portion of pudding. He ate a mouthful. It was delicious. He ate another. Something tinkled faintly on his plate. He investigated with a fork. Bridget, on his left, came to his aid. You've got something, Monsieur Poirot, she said. I wonder what it is. Poirot detached a little silver object from the surrounding raisins that clung to it. Ooh, said Bridget, it's the bachelor's button. Monsieur Poirot's got the bachelor's button. Hercule Poirot dipped the small silver button into the finger glass of water that stood by his plate and washed it clear of pudding crumbs. It is very pretty, he observed. But that means you're going to be a bachelor, Monsieur Poirot, explained Colin helpfully. That is to be expected, said Poirot gravely. I have been a bachelor for many long years, and it is unlikely that I shall change that status now. Oh, never say die, said Michael. I saw in the paper that someone of ninety-five married a girl of twenty-two the other day. You encourage me, said Hercule Poirot. Colonel Lacey uttered a sudden exclamation. His face became purple, and his hand went to his mouth. Confounded, Emmeline, he roared. Why on earth do you let the cook put glass in the pudding? Glass? cried Mrs. Lacey, astonished. Colonel Lacey withdrew the offending substance from his mouth. Might have broken a tooth, he grumbled, or swallowed the damn thing and had appendicitis. He dropped the piece of glass into the finger bowl, rinsed it, and held it up. God bless my soul, he ejaculated. It's a red stone out of one of the cracker brooches, he held it aloft. You permit? Very deftly, Monsieur Poirot stretched across his neighbour, took it from Colonel Lacey's fingers, and examined it attentively. As the squire had said, it was an enormous red stone, the colour of a ruby. The light gleamed from its facets as he turned it about. Somewhere around the table, a chair was pushed back sharply, and then drawn in again. Phew! cried Michael. How wizard it would be if it was real! Perhaps it is real, said Bridget, hopefully. Oh, don't be an ass, Bridget. Why, a ruby of that size would be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, wouldn't it, Monsieur Poirot? It would indeed, said Poirot. But what I can't understand, said Mrs. Lacey, is how it got into the pudding. Ooh, said Colin, diverted by his last mouthful. Oh, I've got the pig. It isn't fair. Bridget chanted immediately, Colin's got the pig, Colin's got the pig, Colin is the greedy, gasling pig. I've got the ring, said Diana in a clear, high voice. Good for you, Diana. You'll be married first of us all. I've got the thimble, wailed Bridget. Bridget's going to be an old maid, chanted the two boys. Yeah, Bridget's going to be an old maid. Who's got the money, demanded David. There's a real ten shilling piece gold in this pudding. I know, Mrs. Ross told me so. I think I'm the lucky one, 
said Desmond Lee Wortley. Colonel Lacey's two next-door neighbours heard him mutter, Yes, you would be. I've got a ring too, said David. He looked across at Diana. Quite a coincidence, isn't it? The laughter went on. Nobody noticed that Monsieur Poirot carelessly, as though thinking of something else, had dropped the red stone into his pocket. Mince pies and Christmas dessert followed the pudding. The older members of the party then retired for a welcome siesta before the tea-time ceremony of the lighting of the Christmas tree. Hercule Poirot, however, did not take a siesta. Instead, he made his way to the enormous old-fashioned kitchen. It is permitted, he asked, looking round and beaming, that I congratulate the cook on this marvellous meal that I have just eaten. There was a moment's pause, and then Mrs. Ross came forward in a stately manner to meet him. She was a large woman, nobly built, with all the dignity of a stage duchess. Two lean, grey-haired women were beyond in the scullery washing up, and a tow-haired girl was moving to and fro between the scullery and the kitchen. But these were obviously mere myrmidons. Mrs. Ross was the queen of the kitchen quarters. Oh, I'm glad to hear you enjoyed it, sir, she said graciously. Enjoyed it, cried Hercule Poirot. With an extravagant foreign gesture, he raised his hands to his lips, kissed it, and wafted the kiss to the ceiling. But you are a genius, Mrs. Ross, a genius. Never have I tasted such a wonderful meal. The oyster soup, he made an expressive noise with his lips, and the stuffing, the chestnut stuffing in the turkey, that was quite unique in my experience. Well, it's funny you should say that, sir, said Mrs. Ross graciously. It's a very special recipe, that stuffing. It was given me by an Austrian chef that I worked with many years ago. But all the rest, she added, is just good, plain English cooking. And is there anything better? demanded Hercule Poirot. Well, it's nice of you to say so, sir. Of course, you being a foreign gentleman might have preferred the continental style. Not but what I can't manage continental dishes, too. I'm sure, Mrs. Ross, you could manage anything. But you must know that English cooking, good English cooking, not the cooking one gets in the second-class hotels or the restaurants, is much appreciated by gourmets on the continent. And I believe that I am correct in saying that a special expedition was made to London in the early 1800s, and a report sent back to France of the wonders of the English puddings. We have nothing like that in France, they wrote. It is worth making a journey to London just to taste the varieties and excellencies of the English puddings. And above all puddings, continued Poirot, well launched now on a kind of rhapsody, is the Christmas plum pudding, such as we have eaten today. That was a homemade plum pudding, was it not? Not a bought one. Oh, yes, indeed, sir. Of my own making, my own recipe, such as I've made for many years. When I came here, Mrs. Lacey said that she'd ordered a pudding from a London store to save me the trouble. But no, madam, I said, that may be kind of you, but no bought pudding from a store can equal a homemade Christmas one. Mind you, said Mrs. Ross, warming to her subject like the artist she was, it was made too soon before the day. A good Christmas pudding should be made some weeks before and allowed to wait. The longer they're kept, within reason, the better they are. I mind now that when I was a child and we went to church every Sunday, we'd start listening for the collect that begins, Stir up, O Lord, we beseech thee, because that collect was the signal, as it were, that the pudding should be made that week, and so they always were. We had the collect on the Sunday, and that week, sure enough, my mother would make the Christmas puddings. And so it should have been here this year. As it was, that pudding was only made three days ago, the day before you arrived, sir. However, I kept the old custom... Everyone in the house had to come into the kitchen and have a stir and make a wish. That's an old custom, sir, and I've always held to it. Most interesting, said Hercule Poirot, most interesting. And so everyone came out into the kitchen. Yes, sir. Uh, the young gentleman, Miss Bridget, and the London gentleman who's staying here, and his sister, and Mr. David, and Miss Diana, oh, Mrs. Middleton, I should say, all had a stir, sir, they did. How many puddings did you make? Is this the only one? Oh, no, sir. I made four. Two large ones and two smaller ones. The other large one I planned to serve on New Year's Day, and the smaller ones were for Colonel and Mrs. Lacey when they're alone-like, and not so many in the family. I see, I see, said Poirot. As a matter of fact, sir, said Mrs. Ross, it was the wrong pudding you had for lunch today. The wrong pudding? Poirot frowned. How is that? Well, sir, 
We have a big Christmas mould, a china mould with a pattern of holly and mistletoe on top, and we always have the Christmas Day pudding boiled in that. But there was a most unfortunate accident. This morning, when Annie was getting it down from the shelf in the larder, she slipped and dropped it, and it broke. Well, sir, naturally I couldn't serve that, could I? There might have been splinters in it. So we had to use the other one, the New Year's Day one, which is in a plain bowl. It makes a nice round, but it's not so decorative as the Christmas mould. Really, where we'll get another mould like that, I don't know. They don't make things in that size nowadays, all tiddly bits of things. Why, you can't even buy a breakfast dish that'll take a proper eight to ten eggs and bacon. Ah, uh, things aren't what they were. No, indeed, said Poirot. But today that is not so. This Christmas Day has been like the Christmas days of old. Is that not true? Mrs. Ross sighed. Well, I'm glad you say so, sir. But, of course, I haven't the help now that I used to have. Not skilled help, that is. The girls nowadays, she lowered her voice slightly, they mean very well, and they're very willing. But they've not been trained, sir, if you understand what I mean. Times change, yes, said Hercule Poirot. I do find it sad sometimes. This house, sir, said Mrs. Ross, it's too large, you know, for the mistress and the colonel. The mistress, she knows that. Living in a corner of it as they do, it's not the same thing at all. It only comes alive, as you might say, at Christmas time, when all the family come. It is the first time, I think, that Mr. Lee Wortley and his sister have been here. Yes, sir. A note of slight reserve crept into Mrs. Ross's voice. A very nice gentleman he is, but, well... Seems a funny friend for Miss Sarah to have, according to our ideas. But there, London ways are different. It's sad that his sister's so poorly. Had an operation, she had. She seemed all right the first day she was here, but that very day, after we'd been stirring the puddings, she was took bad again, and she's been in bed ever since. Got up too soon after her operation, I expect. Aha! <laughs> Doctors nowadays, they have you out of hospital before you can hardly stand on your feet. Why, my very own nephew's wife and Mrs. Ross went into a long and spirited tale of hospital treatment as accorded to her relations, comparing it unfavourably with the consideration that had been lavished upon them in older times. Poirot duly commiserated with her. It remains, he said, to thank you for this exquisite and sumptuous meal. You permit a little acknowledgement of my appreciation? A crisp five-pound note passed from his hand into that of Mrs. Ross, who said perfunctorily, oh, you really shouldn't do that, sir. I insist, I insist. Well, it's very kind of you indeed, sir. Mrs. Ross accepted the tribute as no more than her due. And I wish you, sir, a very happy Christmas and a prosperous new year. End of disc. Please continue with the next disc. Disc 2. The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding Concluded. The end of Christmas Day was like the end of most Christmas days. The tree was lighted, a splendid Christmas cake came in for tea, was greeted with approval, but was partaken of only moderately. There was cold supper. Both Poirot and his host and hostess went to bed early. Good night, Monsieur Poirot, said Mrs. Lacey. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. It has been a wonderful day, madame, wonderful. You are looking very thoughtful, said Mrs. Lacey. It is the English pudding that I consider. Oh, you find it a little heavy, perhaps? asked Mrs. Lacey, delicately. No, no, I do not speak astronomically. I consider its significance. Well, it's traditional, of course, said Mrs. Lacey. Well, good night, Monsieur Poirot, and don't dream too much of Christmas puddings and mince pies. Yes, murmured Poirot to himself as he undressed. It is a problem, certainly. That Christmas plum pudding. There is here something that I do not understand at all. He shook his head in a vexed manner. Well, we shall see. After making certain preparations, Poirot went to bed, but not to sleep. It was some two hours later that his patience was rewarded. The door of his bedroom opened very gently. He smiled to himself. It was as he had thought it would be. His mind went back fleetingly to the cup of coffee so politely handed him by Desmond Lee Wortley. A little later, when Desmond's back was turned, he had laid the cup down for a few moments on a table. He had then apparently picked it up again, 
and Desmond had had the satisfaction, if satisfaction it was, of seeing him drink the coffee to the last drop. But a little smile lifted Poirot's moustache as he reflected that it was not he, but someone else who was sleeping a good, sound sleep tonight. That pleasant young David, said Poirot to himself, he is worried, unhappy. It will do him no harm to have a night's really sound sleep. And now, let us see what will happen. He lay quite still, breathing in an even manner, with occasionally a suggestion, but the very faintest suggestion of a snore. Someone came up to the bed and bent over him. Then, satisfied, that someone turned away and went to the dressing table. By the light of a tiny torch, the visitor was examining Poirot's belongings, neatly arranged on top of the dressing table. Fingers explored the wallet, gently pulled open the drawers of the dressing table, then extended the search to the pockets of Poirot's clothes. Finally, the visitor approached the bed, and with great caution slid his hand under the pillow. Withdrawing his hand, he stood for a moment or two as though uncertain what to do next. He walked round the room, looking inside ornaments, went into the adjoining bathroom, from whence he presently returned. Then, with a faint exclamation of disgust, he went out of the room. Ah, said Poirot under his breath, you have a disappointment. Yes, yes, a serious disappointment. Bah! To imagine even that Hercule Poirot would hide something where you could find it. Then, turning over on his other side, he went peacefully to sleep. He was aroused next morning by an urgent, soft tapping on his door. Qui est là? Come in, come in. The door opened. Breathless, red-faced, Colin stood upon the threshold. Behind him stood Michael. Monsieur Poirot! Monsieur Poirot! But yes, Poirot sat up in bed. It is the early tea. Uh, but no, it is you, Colin. What has occurred? Colin was for a moment speechless. He seemed to be under the grip of some strong emotion. In actual fact, it was the sight of the nightcap that Hercule Poirot wore that affected for the moment his organs of speech. Presently he controlled himself and spoke. I think, Monsieur Poirot, could you help us? Something rather awful has happened. Something has happened? But what? It's, it's Bridget. She's out there in the snow. I think, well, she doesn't move or speak, and, oh, you'd better come and look for yourself. I'm terribly afraid she may be dead. What? Poirot cast aside his bed covers. Mademoiselle Bridget? Dead? I think, uh, I think somebody's killed her. There's, there's blood and, uh, oh, do come. But certainly, certainly, I, I come on the instant. With great practicality, Poirot inserted his feet into his outdoor shoes and pulled a fur-lined overcoat over his pyjamas. I come, he said. I come on the moment. You have aroused the house? No, no, so far I haven't told anyone but you. I thought it would be better. Grandfather and Gran aren't up yet. They're laying breakfast downstairs, but I didn't say anything to Peveril. She, well, Bridget, she's around the other side of the house, near the terrace and the library window. I see. Lead the way. I will follow. Turning away to hide his delighted grin, Colin led the way downstairs. They went out through the side door. It was a clear morning, with the sun not yet high over the horizon. It was not snowing now, but it had snowed heavily during the night, and everywhere around was an unbroken carpet of thick snow. The world looked very pure and white and beautiful. There, said Colin breathlessly, I, it's, there, he pointed dramatically. The scene was indeed dramatic enough. A few yards away, Bridget lay in the snow. She was wearing scarlet pyjamas and a white wool wrap thrown round her shoulders. The white wool wrap was stained with crimson. Her head was turned aside and hidden by the mass of her outspread black hair. One arm was under her body. The other lay flung out, the fingers clenched, and standing up in the center of the crimson stain was the hilt of a large, curved Kurdish knife, which Colonel Lacey had shown to his guests only the evening before. Mon Dieu! ejaculated Monsieur Poirot. It is like something on the stage. There was a faint choking noise from Michael. Colin thrust himself quickly into the breach. I know, he said. It, it doesn't seem real somehow, does it? Do you see those footprints? I suppose we mustn't disturb them. Ah, yes, the footprints. No, we must be careful not to disturb those footprints. That's what I thought, said Colin. That's why I wouldn't let anyone go near her until we got you. I thought you'd know what to do. 
All the same, said Hercule Poirot briskly. First, we must see if she is still alive, is that not so? Well, yes, of course, said Michael, a little doubtfully. But you see, we thought... I mean, we didn't like... Ah, you have the prudence. You have read the detective stories. It is most important that nothing should be touched and that the body should be left as it is. But we cannot be sure as yet if it is a body, can we? After all, though prudence is admirable, common humanity comes first. We must think of the doctor, must we not, before we think of the police? Oh, yes, of course, said Colin, still a little taken aback. We only thought... I mean, we thought we'd better get you before we did anything, said Michael hastily. Then you will both remain here, said Poirot. I will approach from the other side so as not to disturb these footprints. Such excellent footprints, are they not? So very clear. The footprints of a man and a girl going out together to the place where she lies, and then the man's footsteps come back. But the girl's do not. Well, they must be the footprints of the murderer, said Colin, with bated breath. Exactly said Poirot. The footprints of the murderer. A long, narrow foot, with a rather peculiar type of shoe. Very interesting. Easy, I think, to recognize. Yes, those footprints will be very important. At that moment, Desmond Lee Wortley came out of the house with Sarah and joined them. What on earth are you all doing here? he demanded in a somewhat theatrical manner. I saw you from my bedroom window. What's up? Good Lord. What's this? It looks like... Exactly, said Hercule Poirot. It looks like murder, does it not? Sarah gave a gasp, and then shot a quick, suspicious glance at the two boys. Oh, you mean someone's killed the girl? What's her name, Bridget? demanded Desmond. Who on earth would want to kill her? It's unbelievable. There are many things that are unbelievable, said Poirot. Especially before breakfast, is it not? That is what one of your classics says. Six impossible things before breakfast. He added, Please wait here, all of you. Carefully making a circuit, he approached Bridget and bent for a moment down over the body. Colin and Michael were now both shaking with suppressed laughter. Sarah joined them, murmuring, What have you two been up to? Good old Bridget, whispered Colin. Isn't she wonderful? Not a twitch. I've never seen anything look so dead as Bridget does, whispered Michael. Hercule Poirot straightened up again. This is a terrible thing, he said. His voice held an emotion it had not held before. Overcome by mirth, Michael and Colin both turned away. In a choked voice, Michael said, What? What must we do? There is only one thing to do, said Poirot. We must send for the police. Will one of you telephone, or would you prefer me to do it? I think, said Colin, I think, well, what about it, Michael? Yes, said Michael. I, I think the jig's up now. He stepped forward. For the first time, he seemed a little unsure of himself. Look, I'm awfully sorry, he said. I hope you won't mind too much. It, um, well, it was a sort of joke for Christmas and all that. You know, uh, we thought we'd, well, lay on a murder for you. You thought you would lay on a murder for me? Then this... Then this... It, it, it's just a show we put on, explained Colin, to, to make you feel at home, you know. Aha, said Poirot. I understand. You make of me the April Fool, is that it? But today is not April the 1st. It is December the 26th. Well, I suppose we oughtn't to have done it, really, said Colin, but you, you don't mind very much, do you, Monsieur Poirot? Come on, Bridget, he called. Get up. You must be half frozen to death already. The figure in the snow, however, did not stir. It is odd, said Hercule Poirot. She does not seem to hear you. He looked thoughtfully at them. It is a joke, you say? You are sure this is a joke? Why, yes. Colin spoke uncomfortably. We, we didn't mean any harm. But why then does Mademoiselle Bridget not get up? Oh, I can't imagine, said Colin. Oh, come on, Bridget said Sarah impatiently. Don't go on lying there playing the fool. We really are very sorry, Monsieur Poirot, said Colin apprehensively. We do really apologize. You need not apologize, said Poirot in a peculiar tone. What do you mean? Colin stared at him. He turned again. 
Bridget, Bridget, what's the matter? Why doesn't she get up? Why does she go on lying there? Poirot beckoned to Desmond. You, Mr. Lee Worthley, come here. Desmond joined him. Feel her pulse, said Poirot. Desmond Lee Worthley bent down. He touched the arm, the wrist. Well, there's no pulse. He stared at Poirot. Her arm still. Good God, she really is dead. Poirot nodded. Yes, she is dead, he said. Someone has turned the comedy into a tragedy. Or someone? Who? There is a set of footprints going and returning. A set of footprints that bears a strong resemblance to the footprints you have just made, Mr. Lee Wortley, coming from the path to this spot. Desmond Lee Wortley wheeled round. What on earth? Are you accusing me? Me? You're crazy. Why on earth should I want to kill the girl? Ah, why? I wonder. Let us see. He bent down and very gently prized open the stiff fingers of the girl's clenched hand. Desmond drew a sharp breath. He gazed down unbelievingly. In the palm of the dead girl's hand was what appeared to be a large ruby. Is that damn thing out of the pudding? He cried. Is it? said Poirot. Are you sure? Well, of course it is. With a swift movement, Desmond bent down and plucked the red stone out of Bridget's hand. You should not do that, said Poirot reproachfully. Nothing should have been disturbed. Well, I haven't disturbed the body, have I? But this thing might, well, might get lost in its evidence. The great thing is to get the police here as soon as possible. I'll go at once and telephone. He wheeled round and ran sharply towards the house. Sarah came swiftly to Poirot's side. I don't understand, she whispered. Her face was dead white. I don't understand. She caught at Poirot's arm. What did you mean about, about the footprints? Look for yourself, mademoiselle. The footprints that led to the body and back again were the same as the ones just made accompanying Poirot to the girl's body and back. You mean that it was Desmond? Nonsense. Suddenly the noise of a car came through the clear air. They wheeled round. They saw the car clearly enough, driving at a furious pace down the drive, and Sarah recognized what car it was. It's Desmond, she said. It's Desmond's car. He, he must have gone to fetch the police instead of telephoning. Diana Middleton came running out of the house to join them. What's happened? she cried in a breathless voice. Desmond just came rushing into the house. He said something about Bridget being killed. Then he rattled the telephone, but it was dead. He couldn't get an answer. He said the wires must have been cut. He said the only thing was to take a car and go for the police. Why the police? Poirot made a gesture. Bridget? Diana stared at him. Oh, but surely. Isn't it a joke of some kind? I, I heard something, something last night. I thought they were going to play a joke on you, Monsieur Poirot. Yes, said Poirot. That was the idea to play a joke on me. But now come into the house, all of you. We shall catch our deaths of cold here, and there is nothing to be done until Mr. Lee Wortley returns with the police. But look here, said Colin. We, ca we, can't, we can't leave Bridget here alone. You can do her no good by remaining, said Poirot gently. Come. It is a sad, a very sad tragedy, but there is nothing we can do any more to help Mademoiselle Bridget. So let us come in and get warm and have perhaps a cup of tea or of coffee. They followed him obediently into the house. Peveril was just about to strike the gong. If he thought it extraordinary for most of the household to be outside and for Poirot to make an appearance in pyjamas and an overcoat, he displayed no sign of it. Peveril, in his old age, was still the perfect butler. He noticed nothing that he was not asked to notice. They went into the dining room and sat down. When they all had a cup of coffee in front of them and were sipping it, Poirot spoke. I have to recount to you, he said, a little history. I cannot tell you all the details, no, but I can give you the main outline. It concerns a young princeling who came to this country. He brought with him a famous jewel, which he was to have reset for the lady he was going to marry. But unfortunately, before that, he made friends with a very pretty young lady. This pretty young lady did not care very much for the man, but she did care for his jewel. So much so that one day she disappeared with this historic possession, which had belonged to his house for generations. So, the poor young man, he is in a quandary, you see. Above all, he cannot have a scandal. 
Impossible to go to the police. Therefore, he comes to me, to Hercule Poirot. Recover for me, he says, my historic ruby. Eh bien, this young lady, she has a friend. And the friend, he has put through several very questionable transactions. He has been concerned with blackmail, and he has been concerned with the sale of jewellery abroad. Always he has been very clever. He is suspected, yes, but nothing can be proved. It comes to my knowledge that this very clever gentleman, he is spending Christmas here in this house. It is important that the pretty young lady, once she has acquired the jewel, should disappear for a while from circulation, so that no pressure can be put upon her, no questions can be asked her. It is arranged, therefore, that she comes here to King's Lacey, ostensibly as the sister of the clever gentleman. Sarah drew a sharp breath. Oh, no! Oh, no, not here! Not with me here! But so it is, said Poirot. And by a little manipulation, I too become a guest here for Christmas. This young lady, she is supposed to have just come out of hospital. She is much better when she first arrives here. But then comes the news that I too arrive, a detective, a well-known detective. At once she has what you call the wind up. She hides the ruby in the first place she can think of. And then, very quickly, she has a relapse and takes to her bed again. She does not want that I should see her, for doubtless I have a photograph, and I shall recognize her. It is very boring for her, yes, but she has to stay in her room, and her brother, he brings her up the trays. And the ruby? demanded Michael. I think, said Poirot, that at the moment it is mentioned I arrive, the young lady was in the kitchen with the rest of you, all laughing and talking and stirring the Christmas puddings. The Christmas puddings are put into bowls, and the young lady, she hides the ruby, pressing it down into one of the pudding bowls. Not the one that we are going to have on Christmas Day, oh no. That one she knows is in a special mold. She puts it in the other one, the one that is destined to be eaten on New Year's Day. Before then, she will be ready to leave, and when she leaves, no doubt that Christmas pudding will go with her. But see how fate takes a hand. On the very morning of Christmas Day, there is an accident. The Christmas pudding in its fancy mold is dropped on the stone floor, and the mold is shattered to pieces. So what can be done? The good Mrs. Ross, she takes the other pudding and sends it in. Good Lord, said Colin, do you mean that on Christmas Day, when Grandfather was eating his pudding, that that was a real ruby he'd got in his mouth? Precisely, said Poirot. And you can imagine the emotions of Mr. Desmond Lee Wortley when he saw that. Eh bien, what happens next? The ruby is passed round. I examine it, and I manage unobtrusively to slip it in my pocket, in a careless way, as though I was not interested. But one person at least observes what I have done. When I lie in bed, that person searches my room. He searches me. He does not find the ruby. Why? Well, because, said Michael breathlessly, you'd given it to Bridget. That's what you mean, and, and so that's why... But I don't understand quite... I mean, look here, what did happen? Poirot smiled at him. Come now into the library, he said, and look out of the window, and I will show you something that may explain the mystery. He led the way, and they followed him. Consider once again, said Poirot, the scene of the crime. He pointed out of the window. A simultaneous gasp broke from the lips of all of them. There was no body lying on the snow. No trace of the tragedy seemed to remain except a mass of scuffled snow. It, it wasn't all a dream, was it? said Colin faintly. I... has somebody taken the body away? Ah, said Poirot, you see, the mystery of the disappearing body. He nodded his head, and his eyes twinkled gently. Good Lord, cried Michael. Monsieur Poirot, you, you are... you haven't... Oh, well, look here, he's been having us on all this time. Poirot twinkled more than ever. It is true, my children. I also have had my little joke. I knew about your little plot, you see. And so I arranged a counterplot of my own. Ah, voila, Mademoiselle Bridget. None the worse, I hope, for your exposure in the snow. Never should I forgive myself if you had attrapped une friction de poitrine. Bridget had just come into the room. She was wearing a thick skirt and a woolen sweater. She was laughing. I sent a tisane to your room, said Poirot severely. 
You have drunk it? One sip was enough, said Bridget. I'm all right. Did I do it well, Monsieur Poirot? Goodness, my arm hurts still after that tourniquet you made me put on it. You were splendid, my child, said Poirot. Splendid. But see, all the others are still in the fog. Last night, I went to Mademoiselle Bridget. I told her that I knew about your little complot, and I asked her if she would act a part for me. She did it very cleverly. She made the footprints with a pair of Mr. Lee Wortley's shoes. Sarah said in a harsh voice, But what's the point of it all, Monsieur Poirot? What's the point of sending Desmond off to fetch the police? They'll be very angry when they find out it's nothing but a hoax. Poirot shook his head gently. But I do not think for one moment, Mademoiselle, that Mr. Lee Wortley went to fetch the police, he said. Murder is a thing in which Mr. Lee Wortley does not want to be mixed up. He lost his nerve badly. All he could see was his chance to get the ruby. He snatched that, he pretended the telephone was out of order, and he rushed off in a car on the pretense of fetching the police. I think myself it is the last you will see of him for some time. He has, I understand, his own ways of getting out of England. He has his own plane, has he not, mademoiselle? Sarah nodded. Yes, she said. We were thinking of... She stopped. He wanted you to elope with him that way, did he not? Eh bien, that is a very good way of smuggling a jewel out of the country. When you are eloping with a girl, and that fact is publicized, then you will not be suspected of also smuggling a historic jewel out of the country. Oh, yes, that would have made a very good camouflage. I don't believe it, said Sarah. I don't believe a word of it. Then ask his sister, said Poirot, gently nodding his head over her shoulder. Sarah turned her head sharply. A platinum blonde stood in the doorway. She wore a fur coat and was scowling. She was clearly in a furious temper. Sister, my foot, she said, with a short, unpleasant laugh. That swine's no brother of mine. So he's beaten it, has he? And left me to carry the can. The whole thing was his idea. He put me up to it. Said it was money for jam. They'd never prosecute because of the scandal. I could always threaten to say that Ali had given me his historic jewel. Des and I were to have shared the swag in Paris. Now the swine runs out on me. I'd like to murder him. She switched abruptly. The sooner I get out of here... Can someone telephone for a taxi? A car is waiting at the front door to take you to the station, mademoiselle, said Poirot. Think of everything, don't you? Most things, said Poirot complacently. But Poirot was not to get off so easily. When he returned to the dining room after assisting the spurious Miss Lee Wortley into the waiting car... Colin was waiting for him. There was a frown on his boyish face. But look here, Monsieur Poirot. What about the ruby? Do you mean to say that you've let him get away with it? Poirot's face fell. He twirled his moustaches. He seemed ill at ease. I shall recover it yet, he said weakly. There are other ways. I shall still... Well, I do think, said Michael, to let that swine get away with the ruby. Bridget was sharper. He's having us on again, she cried. You are, aren't you, Monsieur Poirot? Shall we do a final conjuring trick, mademoiselle? Feel in my left-hand pocket. Bridget thrust her hand in. She drew it out again with a scream of triumph and held aloft a large ruby, blinking in crimson splendor. You comprehend, explained Poirot. The one that was clasped in your hand was a paste replica. I brought it from London, in case it was possible to make a substitute. You understand, we do not want the scandal. Monsieur Desmond will try and dispose of that ruby in Paris, or in Belgium, or wherever it is that he has his contacts. And then it will be discovered that the stone is not real. What could be more excellent? All finishes happily. The scandal is avoided. My princeling receives his ruby back again, he returns to his country, and makes a sober, and we hope, a happy marriage. All ends well. Except for me, murmured Sarah under her breath. She spoke so low that no one heard her but Poirot. He shook his head gently. You are in error, Mademoiselle Sarah, in what you say there. You have gained experience. All experience is valuable. Ahead of you, I prophesy, there lies happiness. Well, that's what you say, said Sarah. But look here, Monsieur Poirot, Colin was frowning. How did you know about the show we were going to put on for you? It is my business to know things, said Hercule Poirot. He twirled his moustache. 
Yes, but I don't see how you could have managed it. Did someone split? Did someone come and tell you? No, no, not that. Well, then how? Tell us how. They all chorused. Yes, tell us how. But no, Poirot protested. But no, if I tell you how I deduced that, you will think nothing of it. It is like the conjurer who shows how his tricks are done. Oh, tell us, Monsieur Poirot, go on, tell us, tell us. You really wish that I should solve for you this last mystery? Yes, go on, tell us. Ah, I do not think I can. You will be so disappointed. Oh, now come on, Monsieur Poirot, tell us, how did you know? Well, you see. I was sitting in the library by the window in a chair after tea the other day, and I was reposing myself. I had been asleep, and when I awoke you were discussing your plans just outside the window close to me, and the window was open at the top. Is that all? cried Colin, disgusted. How simple! Is it not? said Hercule Poirot, smiling. You see, you are disappointed. Oh, well, said Michael. At any rate, we know everything now. Do we? murmured Hercule Poirot to himself. I do not. I, whose business it is to know things. He walked out into the hall, shaking his head a little. For perhaps the twentieth time, he drew from his pocket a rather dirty piece of paper. Don't eat none of the plum pudding. One as wishes you well. Hercule Poirot shook his head reflectively. He who could explain everything could not explain this. Humiliating. Who had written it? Why had it been written? Until he found that out, he would never know a moment's peace. Suddenly, he came out of his reverie to be aware of a peculiar gasping noise. He looked sharply down. On the floor, busy with a dustpan and brush, was a tow-headed creature in a flowered overall. She was staring at the paper in his hand with large, round eyes. Who, oh, sir? said this apparition. Who, oh, sir? Please, sir. And who may you be, mon enfant? inquired Monsieur Poirot genially. Annie Bates, sir, please, sir. I come here to help Mrs. Ross. I, I didn't mean, sir, I didn't mean to, um, to do anything I shouldn't do. I did mean it well, sir, for your, for your good, I mean. Enlightenment came to Poirot. He held out the dirty piece of paper. Did you write that, Annie? I didn't mean any harm, sir, really I didn't. Of course you didn't, Annie, he smiled at her. But tell me about it. Why did you write this? Well, it was them two, sir, Mr. Lee Wortley and his sister. Not that she was his sister, I'm sure. None of us thought so, and she wasn't ill a bit. We could all tell that. We thought, we all thought something queer was going on. I'll tell you straight, sir. I was in her bathroom, taking in the clean towels, and I listened at the door. E was in her room, and they were talking together. I heard what they said, plain as plain. This detective, he was saying, this fellow Poirot, who's coming here, we've got to do something about it. We've got to get him out of the way as soon as possible. And then he says to her, in a nasty, sinister sort of way, lowering his voice, where did you put it? And she answered him, in the pudding. Oh, sir, my heart gave such a leap, I thought it would stop beating. I thought they meant to poison you in the Christmas pudding. I didn't know what to do. Mrs. Ross, she wouldn't listen to the likes of me. Then the idea came to me as I write you a warning. And I did. I put it on your pillow, where you'd find it when you went to bed. Annie paused breathlessly. Poirot surveyed her gravely for some minutes. You see too many sensational films, I think, Annie, he said at last. Or perhaps it is the television that affects you. But the important thing is that you have the good heart and a certain amount of ingenuity. When I return to London, I will send you a present. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, thank you very much, sir. What would you like, Annie, as a present? Anything I like, sir. Could I have anything I like? Within reason, said Hercule Poirot prudently. Yes. Oh, sir. Could I have a vanity box? A real posh slap of vanity box, like the one Mr. Lee Wortley's sister, what wasn't his sister, had? Yes, said Poirot. Yes. I think that could be managed. It is interesting, he mused. I was in the museum the other day, observing some antiquities from Babylon, or one of those places, thousands of years old, and among them were cosmetic boxes. The heart of woman does not change. Beg your pardon, sir, said Annie. Oh, it is nothing, said Poirot. I reflect. 
You shall have your vanity box, child. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, thank you very much indeed, sir. Annie departed ecstatically. Poirot looked after her, nodding his head in satisfaction. Ah, he said to himself, and now I go. There is nothing more to be done here. A pair of arms slipped round his shoulders unexpectedly. If you will stand just under the mistletoe, said Bridget. Hercule Poirot enjoyed it. He enjoyed it very much. He said to himself that he had had a very good Christmas. The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is pleased to present The Mystery of the Spanish Chest by Agatha Christie. Read by Hugh Fraser. This is complete and unabridged, an audio edition's mystery master. Punctual to the moment, as always, Hercule Poirot entered the small room where Miss Lemon, his efficient secretary, awaited her instructions for the day. At first sight, Miss Lemon seemed to be composed entirely of angles, thus satisfying Poirot's demand for symmetry. Not that where women were concerned, Hercule Poirot carried his passion for geometrical precision so far. He was, on the contrary, old-fashioned. He had a continental prejudice for curves. It might be said for voluptuous curves. He liked women to be women. He liked them lush, highly coloured, exotic. There had been a certain Russian countess, but that was long ago now, a folly of earlier days. But Miss Lemon he had never considered as a woman. She was a human machine, an instrument of precision. Her efficiency was terrific. She was forty-eight years of age, and was fortunate enough to have no imagination whatever. Good morning, Miss Lemon. Good morning, Mr. Poirot. Poirot sat down, and Miss Lemon placed before him the morning's mail, neatly arranged in categories. She resumed her seat, and sat with pad and pencil at the ready. But there was to be this morning a slight change in routine. Poirot had brought in with him the morning newspaper, and his eyes were scanning it with interest. The headlines were big and bold. Spanish chest mystery. Latest developments. You have read the morning papers, I presume, Miss Lemon. Yes, Mr. Poirot. The news from Geneva is not very good. Poirot waved away the news from Geneva in a comprehensive sweep of the arm. A Spanish chest, he mused. Can you tell me, Miss Lemon, what exactly is a Spanish chest? Well, I suppose, Mr. Poirot, that it is a chest that came originally from Spain. One might reasonably suppose so. You have, then, no expert knowledge? Well, they are usually of the Elizabethan period, I believe, large and with a good deal of brass decoration on them. They look very nice when well kept and polished. My sister bought one at a sale. She keeps household linen in it. It looks very nice. I am sure that in the house of any sister of yours all the furniture would be well kept, said Poirot, bowing gracefully. Miss Lemon replied sadly that servants did not seem to know what elbow grease was nowadays. Poirot looked a little puzzled, but decided not to inquire into the inward meaning of the mysterious phrase, elbow grease. He looked down again at the newspaper, conning over the names, Major Rich, Mr. and Mrs. Clayton, Commander McLaren, Mr. and Mrs. Spence, names, nothing but names to him, yet all possessed of human personalities, hating, loving, fearing. A drama, this, in which he, Hercule Poirot, had no part, and he would have liked to have had a part in it. Six people at an evening party, in a room with a big Spanish chest against the wall. Six people, five of them talking, eating a buffet supper, putting records on the gramophone, dancing, and the sixth, dead, in the Spanish chest. Ah, thought Poirot, how my dear friend Hastings would have enjoyed this. What the romantic flights of imagination he would have had. What ineptitudes he would have uttered. Ah, Sir Cher Hastings, at this moment today I miss him. Instead, he sighed and looked at Miss Lemon. Miss Lemon, intelligently perceiving that Poirot was in no mood to dictate letters, had uncovered her typewriter and was awaiting her moment to get on with certain arrears of work. Nothing could have interested her less than sinister Spanish chests containing dead bodies. Poirot sighed and looked down at a photographed face. 
Reproductions in newsprint were never very good, and this was decidedly smudgy. But what a face. Mrs. Clayton, the wife of the murdered man. On an impulse, he thrust the paper at Miss Lemon. Look, he demanded, look at that face. Miss Lemon looked at it obediently, without emotion. What do you think of her, Miss Lemon? That is Mrs. Clayton. Miss Lemon took the paper, glanced casually at the picture, and remarked, She's a little like the wife of our bank manager when we lived in Croydon Heath. Interesting, said Poirot. Recount to me, if you will be so kind, the history of your bank manager's wife. Well, it's not really a very pleasant story, Mr. Poirot. It was in my mind that it might not be. Continue. There was a good deal of talk about Mrs. Adams and a young artist. Then Mr. Adams shot himself. But Mrs. Adams wouldn't marry the other man, and he took some kind of poison. But they pulled him through it all right, and finally Mrs. Adams married a young solicitor. I believe there was more trouble after that, only, of course, we'd left Croydon Heath by then, so I didn't hear very much more about it. Hercule Poirot nodded gravely. She was uh, beautiful? Well, not really what you'd call beautiful, but there seemed to be something about her. Exactly. What is that something that they possess, the sirens of this world, the Helens of Troy, the Cleopatras? Miss Lemon inserted a piece of paper vigorously into her typewriter. Oh, really, Mr. Poirot? I've never really thought about it. It seems all very silly to me. If people would just go on with their jobs and didn't think about such things, it would be much better. Having thus disposed of human frailty and passion, Miss Lemon let her fingers hover over the keys of the typewriter waiting impatiently to be allowed to begin her work. That is your view, said Poirot, and at this moment it is your desire that you should be allowed to get on with your job. But your job, Miss Lemon, is not only to take down my letters, to file my papers, to deal with my telephone calls, to typewrite my letters, all these things you do admirably. But me? I deal not only with documents, but with human beings, and there too I need assistance. Certainly, Mr. Poirot, said Miss Lemon patiently. What is it you want me to do? This case interests me. I should be glad if you would make a study of this morning's report of it in all the papers, and also of any additional reports in the evening papers. Make me a précis of the facts. Very good, Mr. Poirot. Poirot withdrew to his sitting room, a rueful smile on his face. It is indeed the irony, he said to himself, that after my dear friend Hastings, I should have Miss Lemon. What greater contrast can one imagine? Sir Cher Hastings, how he would have enjoyed himself, how he would have walked up and down talking about it, putting the most romantic construction on every incident, believing as gospel truth every word the papers have printed about it. And my poor Miss Lemon, what I have asked her to do, she will not enjoy at all. Miss Lemon came to him in due course with a typewritten sheet. I've got the information you wanted, Mr. Poirot. I'm afraid, though, it can't be regarded as reliable. The papers vary a good deal in their accounts. I shouldn't like to guarantee that the facts as stated are more than 60% accurate. That is probably a conservative estimate, murmured Poirot. Thank you, Miss Lemon, for the trouble you have taken. The facts were sensational, but clear enough. Major Charles Rich, a well-to-do bachelor, had given an evening party to a few of his friends at his apartment. These friends consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Clayton, Mr. and Mrs. Spence, and a Commander McLaren. Commander McLaren was a very old friend of both Rich and the Claytons. Mr. and Mrs. Spence, a younger couple, were fairly recent acquaintances. Arnold Clayton was in the Treasury. Jeremy Spence was a junior civil servant. Major Rich was 48. Arnold Clayton was 55. Commander McLaren was 46. Jeremy Spence was 37. Mrs. Clayton was said to be some years younger than her husband. One person was unable to attend the party. At the last moment, Mr. Clayton was called away to Scotland on urgent business and was supposed to have left King's Cross by the 8.15 train. The party proceeded, as such parties do. Everyone appeared to be enjoying themselves. It was neither a wild party nor a drunken one. It broke up about 11.45. The four guests left together and shared a taxi. Commander McLaren was dropped first at his club, 
and then the Spences dropped Margarita Clayton at Cardigan Gardens, just off Sloane Street, and went on themselves to their house in Chelsea. The gruesome discovery was made on the following morning by Major Rich's manservant, William Burgess. The latter did not live in. He arrived early, so as to clear up the sitting room before calling Major Rich with his early morning tea. It was whilst clearing up that Burgess was startled to find a big stain discolouring the light-coloured rug on which stood the Spanish chest. It seemed to have seeped through from the chest, and the valet immediately lifted up the lid of the chest and looked inside. He was horrified to find there the body of Mr. Clayton, stabbed through the neck. Obeying his first impulse, Burgess rushed out into the street and fetched the nearest policeman. Such were the bald facts of the case. But there were further details. The police had immediately broken the news to Mrs. Clayton, who had been completely prostrated. She had seen her husband for the last time at a little after six o'clock on the evening before. He had come home much annoyed, having been summoned to Scotland on urgent business in connection with some property that he owned. He had urged his wife to go to the party without him. Mr. Clayton had then called in at his and Commander McLaren's club, had had a drink with his friend, and had explained the position. He had then said, looking at his watch, that he had just time on his way to King's Cross to call in on Major Rich and explain. He had already tried to telephone him, but the line had seemed to be out of order. According to William Burgess, Mr. Clayton arrived at the flat at about 7.55. Major Rich was out, but was due to return any moment so Burgess suggested that Mr. Clayton should come in and wait. Clayton said he had no time, but would come in and write a note. He explained that he was on his way to catch a train at King's Cross. The valet showed him into the sitting room, and himself returned to the kitchen, where he was engaged in the preparation of canapes for the party. The valet did not hear his master return, but about ten minutes later, Major Rich looked into the kitchen and told Burgess to hurry out and get some Turkish cigarettes which were Mrs. Spencer's favourite smoking. The valet did so, and brought them to his master in the sitting-room. Mr. Clayton was not there, but the valet naturally thought he had already left to catch his train. Major Rich's story was short and simple. Mr. Clayton was not in the flat when he himself came in, and he had no idea that he had been there. No note had been left for him, and the first he heard of Mr. Clayton's journey to Scotland was when Mrs. Clayton and the others arrived. There were two additional items in the evening papers. Mrs. Clayton, who was prostrated with shock, had left her flat in Cardigan Gardens and was believed to be staying with friends. The second item was in the stop press. Major Charles Rich had been charged with the murder of Arnold Clayton and had been taken into custody. So, that is that, said Poirot, looking up at Miss Lemon. The arrest of Major Rich was to be expected. But what a remarkable case. What a very remarkable case. Do you not think so? Well, I suppose such things do happen, Mr. Poirot, said Miss Lemon, without interest. Oh, certainly. They happen every day, or nearly every day. But usually they are quite understandable, though distressing. It's certainly a very unpleasant business. To be stabbed to death and stowed away in a Spanish chest is certainly unpleasant for the victim, supremely so. But when I say this is a remarkable case, I refer to the remarkable behaviour of Major Rich. Miss Lemon said with faint distaste, There seems to be a suggestion that Major Rich and Mrs. Clayton were very close friends. It was a suggestion and not a proved fact, so I did not include it. That was very correct of you. But it is an inference that leaps to the eye. Is that all you have to say? Miss Lemon looked blank. Poirot sighed, and missed the rich, colourful imagination of his friend Hastings. Discussing a case with Miss Lemon was uphill work. Consider for a moment this Major Rich. He is in love with Mrs. Clayton, granted. He wants to dispose of her husband, that too we grant. Though, if Mrs. Clayton is in love with him, and they are having the affair together, where is the urgency? It is perhaps that Mr. Clayton will not give his wife the divorce. But it is not of all this that I talk. Major Rich, he is a retired soldier. 
and it is said sometimes that soldiers are not brainy, but to the mem. This Major Rich, is he... can he be a complete imbecile? Miss Lemon did not reply. She took this to be a purely rhetorical question. Well, demanded Poirot, what do you think about it all? Oh, what do I think? Miss Lemon was startled. May we? You? Miss Lemon adjusted her mind to the strain put upon it. She was not given to mental speculation of any kind unless asked for it. In such leisure moments as she had, her mind was filled with the details of a superlatively perfect filing system. It was her only mental recreation. Well, she began, and paused. Tell me just what happened. What do you think happened on that evening? Mr. Clayton is in the sitting room, writing a note. Major Rich comes back. What then? Well, he finds Mr. Clayton there. They, I suppose they have a quarrel. Major Rich stabs him. Then, when he sees what he has done, he puts the body in the chest. After all, the guests, I suppose, might be arriving any minute. Yes, yes, the guests arrive. The body is in the chest. The evening passes. The guests depart. And then? Well, then, I suppose, Major Rich goes to bed and... Oh! Ah! said Poirot. You see it now. You have murdered a man. You have concealed his body in a chest, and then you go peacefully to bed, quite unperturbed by the fact that your valet will discover the crime in the morning? Well, I suppose it is possible that the valet might never have looked inside the chest, with an enormous pool of blood on the carpet underneath it. Perhaps Major Rich didn't realize the blood was there. Was it not somewhat careless of him not to look and see? I dare say he was upset, said Miss Lemon. Poirot threw up his hands in despair. Miss Lemon seized the opportunity to hurry from the room. The mystery of the Spanish chest was, strictly speaking, no business of Poirot's. He was engaged at the moment in a delicate mission for one of the large oil companies, where one of the high-ups was possibly involved in some questionable transaction. It was hush-hush, important and exceedingly lucrative. It was sufficiently involved to command Poirot's attention, and had the great advantage that it required very little physical activity. It was sophisticated and bloodless, crime at the highest levels. The mystery of the Spanish chest was dramatic and emotional, two qualities which Poirot had often declared to Hastings could be much overrated, and indeed frequently were so by the latter. He had been severe with Sir Cher Hastings on this point, and now here he was, behaving much as his friend might have done, obsessed with beautiful women, crimes of passion, jealousy, hatred, and all the other romantic causes of murder. He wanted to know about it all. He wanted to know what Major Rich was like, and what his manservant Burgess was like, and what Margarita Clayton was like, though that he thought he knew, and what the late Arnold Clayton had been like, since he held that the character of the victim was of the first importance in a murder case and even what Commander McLaren, the faithful friend, and Mr. and Mrs. Spence, the recently acquired acquaintances, were like. And he did not see exactly how he was going to gratify his curiosity. He reflected on the matter later in the day. Why did the whole business intrigue him so much? He decided, after reflection, that it was because, as the facts were related, the whole thing was more or less impossible. Yes, there was a Euclidean flavour. Starting from what one could accept, there had been a quarrel between two men. Cause? Presumably a woman. One man killed the other in the heat of rage. Yes, that happened. Though it would be more acceptable if the husband had killed the lover. Still, the lover had killed the husband. Stabbed him with a dagger? Somehow, a rather unlikely weapon. Perhaps Major Rich had had an Italian mother... Somewhere, surely, there should be something to explain the choice of a dagger as a weapon. Anyway, one must accept the dagger. Some papers called it a stiletto. It was to hand and was used. The body was concealed in the chest. That was common sense and inevitable. The crime had not been premeditated, and as the valet was returning at any moment and four guests would be arriving before very long, it seemed the only course indicated. The party has held... The guests depart. The manservant is already gone, and Major Rich goes to bed. To understand how that could happen, one must see Major Rich 
and find out what kind of man acts in that way? Could it be that, overcome with horror at what he had done, and the long strain of an evening trying to appear his normal self, he had taken a sleeping pill of some kind, or a tranquilizer, which had put him into a heavy slumber, which lasted long beyond his usual hour of waking? Possible. Or was it a case, rewarding to a psychologist, where Major Rich's feeling of subconscious guilt made him want the crime to be discovered? To make up one's mind on that point, one would have to see Major Rich. It all came back to... The telephone rang. Poirot let it ring for some moments, until he realized that Miss Lemon, after bringing him his letters to sign, had gone home some time ago, and that George had probably gone out. He picked up the receiver. Monsieur Poirot? Speaking? Oh, how splendid. Poirot blinked slightly at the fervor of the charming female voice. It's Abby Chatterton. Ah, Lady Chatterton. How can I serve you? By coming over as quickly as you can, right away to a simply frightful cocktail party that I'm giving. Not just for the cocktail party, it's for something quite different, really. I need you. It's absolutely vital. Please, please, please don't let me down. Don't say you can't manage it. Poirot had not been going to say anything of the kind. Lord Chatterton, apart from being a peer of the realm, and occasionally making a very dull speech in the House of Lords, was nobody in particular, but Lady Chatterton was one of the brightest jewels in what Poirot called Le Haut Monde. Everything she did or said was news. She had brains, beauty, originality, and enough vitality to activate a rocket to the moon. She said again, I need you. Just give that wonderful moustache of yours a lovely twirl and come. It was not quite so quick as that. Poirot had first to make a meticulous toilet. The twirl to the moustaches was added, and he then set off. End of disc. Please continue with the next disc. Disc 3. The Mystery of the Spanish Chest. Concluded. The door of Lady Chatterton's delightful house in Cheriton Street was ajar, and a noise, as of animals mutinying at the zoo, sounded from within. Lady Chatterton, who was holding two ambassadors, an international rugger player, and an American evangelist in play, neatly jettisoned them with the rapidity of sleight of hand, and was at Poirot's side. Monsieur Poirot, how wonderful to see you. No, don't have that nasty martini. I've got something special for you, a kind of syrup that the sheiks drink in Morocco. It's in my own little room upstairs. She led the way upstairs, and Poirot followed her. She paused to say over her shoulder, I didn't put these people off, because it's absolutely essential that no one should know there's anything special going on here, and I've promised the servants enormous bonuses if not a word leaks out. After all, one doesn't want one's house besieged by reporters, and poor darling, she's been through so much already. Lady Chatterton did not stop at the first-floor landing. Instead, she swept on up to the floor above. Gasping for breath and somewhat bewildered, Hercule Poirot followed. Lady Chatterton paused, gave a rapid glance downwards over the banisters, and then flung open a door, exclaiming as she did so, I've got him, Margarita, I've got him. Here he is. She stood aside in triumph to let Poirot enter, then performed a rapid introduction. This is Margarita Clayton. She's a very, very dear friend of mine. You'll help her, won't you? Margarita, this is that wonderful Hercule Poirot. He'll do just everything you want. You will, won't you, dear Monsieur Poirot? And without waiting for the answer, which she obviously took for granted, Lady Chatterton had not been a spoilt beauty all her life for nothing, she dashed out of the door and down the stairs, calling back rather indiscreetly, I've got to go back to all those awful people. The woman who had been sitting in a chair by the window rose and came towards him. He would have recognized her even if Lady Chatterton had not mentioned her name. Here was that wide, that very wide brow, the dark hair that sprang away from it like wings, the grey eyes set far apart. She wore a close-fitting, high-necked gown of dull black that showed up the beauty of her body and the magnolia whiteness of her skin. It was an unusual face rather than a beautiful one, one of those oddly proportioned faces that one sometimes sees in an Italian primitive. There was about her a kind of medieval simplicity, a strange innocence that could be, Poirot thought, more devastating than any voluptuous sophistication. 
When she spoke, it was with a kind of childlike candor. Abby says you will help me. She looked at him gravely and inquiringly. For a moment, he stood quite still, scrutinizing her closely. There was nothing ill-bred in his manner of doing it. It was more the kind but searching look that a famous consultant gives a new patient. Are you sure, madame, he said at last, that I can help you? A little flush rose to her cheeks. I don't know what you mean. What is it, madame, that you want me to do? Oh, she seemed surprised. I thought you knew who I was. I know who you are. Your husband was killed, stabbed, and the Major Rich has been arrested and charged with his murder. The flush heightened. Major Rich did not kill my husband. Quick as a flash, Poirot said, Why not? She stared, puzzled. I... I beg your pardon? I have confused you, because I have not asked the question that everyone asks. The police, the lawyers. Why should Major Rich kill Arnold Clayton? But I ask the opposite. I ask you, madame, why are you sure that Major Rich did not kill him? Because, she paused a moment, because I know Major Rich so well. You know Major Rich so well, repeated Poirot tonelessly. He paused and then said sharply, How well? Whether she understood his meaning, he could not guess. He thought to himself, Here is either a woman of great simplicity or of great subtlety. Many people, he thought, must have wondered that about Margarita Clayton. How well? She was looking at him doubtfully. Five years. No, uh, nearly six, and that was not precisely what I meant. You must understand, madame, that I shall have to ask you the impertinent questions. Perhaps you will speak the truth. Perhaps you will lie. It is very necessary for a woman to lie sometimes. Women must defend themselves, and the lie, it can be a good weapon. But there are three people, madame, to whom a woman should speak the truth. To her father confessor, to her hairdresser, and to her private detective, if she trusts him. Do you trust me, madame? Margarita Clayton drew a deep breath. Yes, she said, I do, and added, I must. Very well, then. What is it you want me to do? Find out who killed your husband? I suppose so, yes. But it is not essential. You want me, then, to clear Major Rich from suspicion? She nodded quickly, gratefully. That? And that only? It was, he saw, an unnecessary question. Margarita Clayton was a woman who saw only one thing at a time. And now, he said, for the impertinence. You and Major Rich, you are lovers, yes? But do you mean, were we having an affair together? No. But he was in love with you? Yes. And you, you were in love with him? I think so. You do not seem quite sure. I am sure, now. Ah, you did not then love your husband? No. You reply with an admirable simplicity. Most women would wish to explain at great length just exactly what their feelings were. How long had you been married? Eleven years. Can you tell me a little about your husband, what kind of a man he was? She frowned. It's difficult. I don't really know what kind of a man Arnold was. He was very quiet, very reserved. One didn't know what he was thinking. He was clever, of course. Everyone said he was brilliant, in his work, I mean. He didn't, how can I put it, he never explained himself at all. Was he in love with you? Oh, yes, he must have been, or he wouldn't have minded so much. She came to a sudden stop. About other men? That is what you were going to say? He was jealous? Again, she said, he must have been. And then, as though feeling that the phrase needed explanation, she went on, Sometimes, for days, he wouldn't speak. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. This violence that has come into your life, is it the first that you have known? Violence? She frowned and then flushed. Is it... Do you mean that poor boy who shot himself? Yes, 
said Poirot. I expect that is what I mean. I'd no idea he felt like that. I, I was sorry for him. He seemed so shy, so lonely. He must have been very neurotic, I think. And there were two Italians, a, a duel. It was ridiculous. Anyway, nobody was killed, thank goodness. And honestly, I, I didn't care about either of them. I never even pretended to care. No, you were just there. And where you are, things happen. I have seen that before in my life. It is because you do not care that men are driven mad. But for Major Rich, you do care. So, we must do what we can. He was silent for a moment or two. She sat there gravely, watching him. We turn from personalities, which are often the really important things, to plain facts. I know only what has been in the papers. On the facts as given there, only two persons had the opportunity of killing your husband. Only two persons could have killed him. Major Rich and Major Rich's manservant. She said stubbornly, I know Charles didn't kill him. So then it must have been the valet. You agree? She said doubtfully, I see what you mean. But you are dubious about it. It just seems fantastic. Yet the possibility is there. Your husband undoubtedly came to the flat since his body was found there. If the valet story is true, Major Rich killed him. But if the valet story is false, then the valet killed him and hid the body in the chest before his master returned. An excellent way of disposing of the body from his point of view. He has only got to notice the blood stain the next morning and discover it. Suspicion will immediately fall on Rich. But why should he want to kill Arnold? Ah, why? The motive cannot be an obvious one, or the police would have investigated it. It is possible that your husband knew something to the valet's discredit and was about to acquaint Major Rich with the facts. Did your husband ever say anything to you about this man Burgess? She shook her head. Do you think he would have done so, if that had indeed been the case? She frowned. It's difficult to say. Possibly not. Arnold never talked much about people. I told you he was reserved. He, he wasn't... He was never a, a chatty man. He was a man who kept his own counsel, yes. Now, what is your opinion of Burgess? He's not the kind of man you notice very much. A fairly good servant. Adequate, but not polished. What age? About thirty-seven or eight, I should think. He'd been a batman in the army during the war, but he wasn't a regular soldier. How long had he been with Major Rich? Oh, not very long. About a year and a half, I think. You never noticed anything odd about his manner towards your husband? We weren't there so very often. No, I noticed nothing at all. Tell me about the events of that evening. What time were you invited? 8.15 for half past. And just what kind of party was it to be? Well, there would be drinks and a kind of buffet supper, usually a very good one. Foie gras and hot toast, smoked salmon. Sometimes there was a hot rice dish. Charles had a special recipe he'd got in the Near East, but that was more for winter. Then we used to have music. Charles had got a very good stereophonic gramophone. Both my husband and Jock McLaren were very fond of classical records, and we had dance music. The Spencers were very keen dancers. It was that sort of thing, a quiet, informal evening. Charles was a very good host. And this particular evening, it was like other evenings there? You noticed nothing unusual, nothing out of place? Out of place? She frowned for a moment. When you say that, I... No, it's gone. There was something... She shook her head again. No, to answer your question, there was nothing unusual at all about that evening. We enjoyed ourselves. Everybody seemed relaxed and happy. She shivered. And to think that all the time... Poirot held up a quick hand. Do not think. This business that took your husband to Scotland. How much do you know about that? Oh, not very much. There was some dispute over the restrictions on selling a piece of land which belonged to my husband. The sale had apparently gone through, and then some sudden snag turned up. What did your husband tell you exactly? He came in with a telegram in his hand. As far as I remember, he said, This is most annoying. 
I shall have to take the night mail to Edinburgh and see Johnston first thing tomorrow morning. Too bad when one thought the thing was going through smoothly at last. Then he said, Shall I ring up Jock and get him to call for you? And I said, Nonsense. I'll just take a taxi. And he said that Jock or the Spencers would see me home. I said, Did he want anything packed? And he said he'd just throw a few things into a bag and have a quick snack at the club before catching the train. Then he went off and... That's the last time I saw him. Her voice broke a little on the last words. Poirot looked at her very hard. Did he show you the telegram? No. A pity. Why do you say that? He did not answer that question. Instead, he said briskly, Now, to business. Who are the solicitors acting for Major Rich? She told him, and he made a note of the address. Will you write a few words to them and give it to me? I shall want to make arrangements to see Major Rich. He... it's been remanded for a week. Naturally, that is the procedure. Will you also write a note to Commander McLaren and to your friends the Spences? I shall want to see all of them, and it is essential that they do not at once show me the door. When she rose from the writing desk, he said, One more thing. I shall register my own impressions, but I also want yours, of Commander McLaren, and of Mr. and Mrs. Spence. Oh, Jock is one of our oldest friends. I've known him ever since I was a child. He appears to be quite a doer person, but he's really a dear. Always the same, always to be relied upon. He's not gay and amusing, but he's a tower of strength. Both Arnold and I relied on his judgment a lot. And he also is doubtless in love with you. Poirot's eyes twinkled slightly. Oh, yes, said Margarita happily. He's always been in love with me. But by now it's become a kind of habit. And the Spencers? Oh, they're amusing and very good company. Linda Spence is really rather a clever girl. Arnold enjoyed talking with her. She's attractive, too. You are friends? She and I? In a way. I don't know that I really like her. She's too malicious. And her husband? Oh, Jeremy is delightful. Very musical. Knows a good deal about pictures, too. He and I go to picture shows a good deal together. Ah, well, I shall see for myself. He took her hand in his. I hope, madame, you will not regret asking for my help. Well, why should I regret it? Her eyes opened wide. One never knows, said Poirot cryptically. And I, I do not know he said to himself as he went down the stairs. The cocktail party was in full spate, but he avoided being captured and reached the street. No, he repeated. I do not know. It was of Margarita Clayton he was thinking. That apparently childlike candor, that frank innocence, was it just that? Or did it mask something else? There had been women like that in medieval days, Women on whom history had not been able to agree. He thought of Mary Stuart, the Scottish Queen. Had she known that night in Kirker Fields of the deed that was to be done? Or was she completely innocent? Had the conspirators told her nothing? Was she one of those childlike, simple women who can say to themselves, I do not know, and believe it? He felt the spell of Margarita Clayton, but he was not entirely sure about her. Such women could be, though innocent themselves, the cause of crimes. Such women could be, in intent and design, criminals themselves, though not in action. Theirs was never the hand that held the life. As to Margarita Clayton, no, he did not know. Hercule Poirot did not find Major Rich's solicitors very helpful. He had not expected to do so. They managed to indicate, though without saying so, that it would be in their client's best interest if Mrs. Clayton showed no sign of activity on his behalf. His visit to them was in the interests of correctness. He had enough pull with the Home Office and the CID to arrange his interview with the prisoner. Inspector Miller, who was in charge of the Clayton case, was not one of Poirot's favourites. He was not, however, hostile on this occasion, merely contemptuous. Can't waste much time on the old dodderer, he had said to his assistant sergeant before Poirot was shown in. Still, I'll have to be polite. 
You'll really have to pull some rabbits out of a hat if you're going to do anything with this one, Monsieur Poirot, he remarked cheerfully. Nobody else but Rich could have killed the bloke, except the valet. Oh, I'll give you the valet, as a possibility, that is. But you won't find anything there. No motives whatsoever. You cannot be entirely sure of that. Motives are very curious things. Well, he wasn't acquainted with Clayton in any way. He's got a perfectly innocuous past, and he seems to be perfectly right in his head. I don't know what more you want. I want to find out that Rich did not commit the crime. To please the lady, eh? Inspector Miller grinned wickedly. She's been getting at you, I suppose. Quite something, isn't she? Cherche la femme with a vengeance. If she'd had the opportunity, you know, she might have done it herself. That? No. You'd be surprised. I once knew a woman like that. Put a couple of husbands out the way without a blink of her innocent blue eyes. Broken-hearted each time, too. The jury would have acquitted her if they'd had half a chance, which they hadn't. The evidence being practically cast iron. Well, my friend, let us not argue. What I make so bold as to ask is a few reliable details on the facts. What a newspaper prints is news, but not always truth. Well, they have to enjoy themselves. What do you want? A time of death, as near as can be. Which can't be very near, because the body wasn't examined until the following morning. Death is estimated to have taken place from 13 to 10 hours previously. That is, between 7 and 10 o'clock the night before. He was stabbed through the jugular vein. Death must have been a matter of moments. And the weapon? A kind of Italian stiletto. Quite small, razor sharp. Nobody's ever seen it before, or knows where it comes from. But we shall know, in the end, it's a matter of time and patience. It could not have been picked up in the course of a quarrel. No. The valet says no such thing was in the flat. What interests me is the telegram, said Poirot. The telegram that called Arnold Clayton away to Scotland. Was that summons genuine? No. There was no hitch or trouble up there. The land transfer, or whatever it was, was proceeding normally. Then who sent that telegram? I am presuming there was a telegram. Well, there must have been. Not that we'd necessarily believe Mrs. Clayton, but Clayton told the valet he was called by wire to Scotland. And he also told Commander McLaren. What time did he see Commander McLaren? Well, they had a snack together at their club. Combined services. That was at about a quarter past seven. Then Clayton took a taxi to Rich's flat, arriving there just before eight o'clock. After that, Miller spread out his hands. Anybody notice anything at all odd about Rich's manner that evening? Oh, well, you know what people are. Once a thing has happened, people think they noticed a lot of things I bet they never saw at all. Mrs. Spence now. She says he was distray all the evening. Didn't always answer to the point. As though he had something on his mind. I bet he had, too, if he had a body in the chest, wondering how the hell to get rid of it. Why didn't he get rid of it? Beats me. Lost his nerve, perhaps. But it was madness to leave it until the next day. He had the best chance he'd ever have that night. There's no night porter on. He could have got his car round, packed the body in the boot. It's a big boot. Driven out in the country and parked it somewhere. He might have been seen getting the body into the car, but the flats are in a side street, and there's a courtyard you drive a car through. At, say, three in the morning, he had a reasonable chance. What does he do? Goes to bed. Sleeps late the next morning and wakes up to find the police in the flat. He went to bed and slept well as an innocent man might do. Have it that way if you like. But do you really believe that yourself? I shall have to leave that question until I have seen the man myself. Think you know an innocent man when you see one? <laughs> it's not so easy as that. I know it is not easy. And I should not attempt to say I could do it. What I want to make up my mind about is whether the man is as stupid as he seems to be. Poirot had no intention of seeing Charles Rich until he had seen everyone else. He started with Commander McLaren. McLaren was a tall, swarthy, uncommunicative man. He had a rugged but pleasant face. He was a shy man and not easy to talk to. But Poirot persevered. Fingering Margarita's note, McLaren said almost reluctantly, Well... If Margarita wants me to tell you all I can, of course I'll do so. Don't know what there is to tell, though. You've heard it all already. But whatever Margarita wants, 
I've always done what she wanted, ever since she was sixteen. She's got a way with her, you know. I know, said Poirot. He went on. First, I should like you to answer a question quite frankly. Do you think Major Rich is guilty? Yes, I do. I wouldn't say so to Margarita, if she wants to think he's innocent, but I simply can't see it any other way. Hang it all, the fellow's got to be guilty. Was there a bad feeling between him and Mr. Clayton? Not in the least. Arnold and Charles were the best of friends. That's what makes the whole thing so extraordinary. Perhaps Major Rich's friendship with Mrs. Clayton. He was interrupted. Fa! <laughs> all that stuff. All the papers slyly hinting at it. Damned innuendos. Mrs. Clayton and Rich were good friends, that's all. Margarita's got a lot of friends. I'm her friend, been one for years. And nothing the whole world mightn't know about it. Same with Charles and Margarita. You do not then consider that they were having an affair together? Certainly not! McLaren was wrathful. Don't go listening to that Hellcat Spence woman. She'd say anything. But perhaps Mr. Clayton suspected there might be something between his wife and Major Rich. You can take it from me he did nothing of the sort. I'd have known if so. Arnold and I were very close. What sort of man was he? You, if anyone, should know. Well, Arnold was a quiet sort of chap. He was clever, quite brilliant, I believe. What they call a first-class financial brain. He was quite high up in the treasury, you know. So I have heard. He read a good deal, and he collected stamps. And he was extremely fond of music. He didn't dance or care much for going out. Was it, do you think, a, a happy marriage? Commander McLaren's answer did not come quickly. He seemed to be puzzling it out. Well, that sort of thing's very hard to say. Yes, I think they were happy. He was devoted to her in his quiet way. I'm sure she was fond of him. They weren't likely to split up, if that's what you're thinking. They hadn't, perhaps, a lot in common. Poirot nodded. It was as much as he was likely to get. He said, Now, tell me about that last evening. Mr. Clayton dined with you at the club. What did he say? He told me he'd got to go to Scotland. Seemed vexed about it. We didn't have dinner, by the way. No time, just sandwiches and a drink. For him, that is. I only had the drink. I was going out to a buffet supper, remember? Uh, Mr. Clayton mentioned the telegram? Yes. He did not actually show you the telegram? No. Did he say he was going to call on Rich? Uh, not definitely. In fact, he said he doubted if he'd have time. He said, Margarita can explain, or you can. And then he said, See, she gets home all right, won't you? Then he went off. It was all quite natural and easy. He had no suspicion at all that the telegram wasn't genuine. Or wasn't it? Commander McLaren looked startled. Apparently not. Well, how very odd. Commander McLaren went into a kind of coma, emerging suddenly to say, But that really is odd. I mean, what's the point? Why should anybody want him to go to Scotland? It is a question that needs answering, certainly. Hercule Poirot left, leaving the commander apparently still puzzling on the matter. The Spences lived in a minute house in Chelsea. Linda Spence received Poirot with the utmost delight. Oh, do tell me, she said. Tell me all about Margarita. Where is she? That I am not at liberty to state, madame. She has hidden herself well. Margarita is very clever at that sort of thing. But she'll be called to give evidence at the trial, I suppose. She can't wriggle herself out of that. Poirot looked at her appraisingly. He decided grudgingly that she was attractive, in the modern style, which at that moment resembled an underfed orphan child. It was not a type he admired. The artistically disordered hair fluffed out round her head. A pair of shrewd eyes watched him from a slightly dirty face, devoid of makeup, save for a vivid cerise mouth. She wore an enormous pale yellow sweater, hanging almost to her knees, and tight black trousers. What's your part in all this? demanded Mrs. Spence. Get the boyfriend out of it somehow, is that it? What a hope. You think, then, that he is guilty? Well, of course, who else? That, Poirot thought, was very much the question. He parried it by asking another question. What did Major Rich seem like to you on that fatal evening? As usual? or not as usual. Linda Spence screwed up her eyes judicially. 
No, he wasn't himself. He was different. How different? Well, surely if you've just stabbed a man in cold blood. But you were not aware at the time that he had just stabbed a man in cold blood, were you? Well, no, of course not. So how do you account for his being different? In what way? Well, this stray. Oh, I don't know. But thinking it over afterwards, I decided that there had definitely been something. Poirot sighed. Who arrived first? We did. Jim and I. And then Jock. And finally Margarita. When was Mr. Clayton's departure for Scotland first mentioned? When Margarita came. She said to Charles, Arnold's terribly sorry. He's had to rush off to Edinburgh by the night train. And Charles said, Oh, that's too bad. And then Jock said, Sorry, thought you already knew. Then we had drinks. Major Rich at no time mentioned seeing Mr. Clayton that evening. He said nothing of his having called in on his way to the station. Well, not that I heard. It was strange, was it not? said Poirot. About that telegram. What was strange? It was a fake. Nobody in Edinburgh knows anything about it. So that's it. I wondered at the time. You have an idea about the telegram? Well, I should say it rather leaps to the eye. How do you mean exactly? My dear man, said Linda, don't play the innocent. Unknown hoaxer gets the husband out of the way. For that night, at all events, the coast is clear. You mean that Major Rich and Mrs. Clayton planned to spend the night together? Well, you have heard of such things, haven't you? Linda looked amused. And the telegram was sent by one or other of them. It wouldn't surprise me. Major Rich and Mrs. Clayton were having an affair together, you think? Let's say I shouldn't be surprised if they were. I don't know it for a fact. Did Mr. Clayton suspect? Arnold was an extraordinary person. He was all bottled up, if you know what I mean. I think he did know, but he was the kind of man who would never have let on. Anyone would think he was a dry stick with no feelings at all. But I'm pretty sure he wasn't like that underneath. The queer thing is that I should have been much less surprised if Arnold had stabbed Charles than the other way about. I've an idea Arnold was really an insanely jealous person. That is interesting. Though it's more likely, really, that he'd have done in Margarita. A fellow, that sort of thing. Margarita, you know, had an extraordinary effect on men. She is a good-looking woman, said Poirot, with judicious understatement. Oh, it was more than that. She had something. She would get men all het up, mad about her, and turn round and look at them with a sort of wide-eyed surprise that drove them balmy. Une femme fatale. Well, that's probably the foreign name for it. You know her well? My dear, she's one of my best friends, and I wouldn't trust her an inch. Ah, said Poirot, and shifted the subject to Commander McLaren. Jock, old faithful, oh, he's a pet, born to be the friend of the family. He and Arnold were really close friends. I think Arnold unbent to him more than to anyone else. And, of course, he was Margarita's tame cat. He'd been devoted to her for years. And was Mr. Clayton jealous of him, too? Jealous of Jock? What an idea! Margarita's genuinely fond of Jock, but she's never given him a thought of that kind. I don't think, really, that one ever would. I don't know why. It seems a shame. He's so nice. Poirot switched to consideration of the valet. But beyond saying vaguely that he mixed a very good sidecar, Linda Spence seemed to have no ideas about Burgess, and indeed seemed barely to have noticed him. But she was quite quick on the uptake. You're thinking, I suppose, that he could have killed Arnold just as easily as Charles could. It seems to me madly unlikely. That remark depresses me, madame. But then, it seems to me, though you will probably not agree, that it is madly unlikely, not that Major Rich should kill Arnold Clayton, but that he should kill him in just the way he did. Stiletto stuff, yes. Definitely not in character. More likely the blunt instrument. Or he might have strangled him, perhaps. Poirot sighed. We are back at Othello, yes. Othello. You have given me there a little idea. Have I? What? There was the sound of a latch key and an opening door. Oh, here's Jeremy. Do you want to talk to him, too? Jeremy Spence was a pleasant-looking man of thirty-odd, well-groomed and almost ostentatiously discreet. 
Mrs. Spence said that she had better go and have a look at a casserole in the kitchen, and went off, leaving the two men together. Jeremy Spence displayed none of the engaging candour of his wife. He was clearly disliking very much being mixed up in the case at all, and his remarks were carefully non-informative. They had known the Clayton some time, Rich not so well. It seemed a pleasant fellow. As far as he could remember, Richard seemed absolutely as usual on the evening in question. Clayton and Rich always seemed on good terms. The whole thing seemed quite unaccountable. Throughout the conversation, Jeremy Spence was making it clear that he expected Poirot to take his departure. He was civil, but only just so. I am afraid, said Poirot, that you do not like these questions. Well, we've had quite a session of this with the police. I rather feel that's enough. We've told all we know or saw. Now, I'd like to forget it. You have my sympathy. It is most unpleasant to be mixed up in this. To be asked not only what you know or what you saw, but perhaps even what you think. Best not to think. But can one avoid it? Do you think, for instance, that Mrs. Clayton was in it too? Did she plan the death of her husband with Rich? Good Lord, no. Spence sounded shocked and dismayed. I'd no idea that there was any question of such a thing. Has your wife not suggested such a possibility? Oh, Linda, <laughs> you know what women are. Always got their knife into each other. Margarita never gets much of a show from her own sex. A darn sight too attractive. But surely, this theory about Rich and Margarita planning murder, that's fantastic. Such things have been known. The weapon, for instance, it is the kind of weapon a woman might possess rather than a man. Do you mean the police have traced it to her? They can't have, I mean... I know nothing, said Poirot truthfully, and escaped hastily. From the consternation on Spence's face, he judged that he had left that gentleman something to think about. You will forgive my saying, Monsieur Poirot, that I cannot see how you can be of assistance to me in any way. Poirot did not answer. He was looking thoughtfully at the man who had been charged with the murder of his friend Arnold Clayton. He was looking at the firm jaw, the narrow head, a lean, brown man, athletic and sinewy. Something of the greyhound about him. A man whose face gave nothing away, and who was receiving his visitor with a marked lack of cordiality. I quite understand that Mrs. Clayton sent you to see me with the best intentions, but quite frankly, I think she was unwise. Unwise both for her own sake and mine. You mean... Rich gave a nervous glance over his shoulder, but the attendant warder was the regulation distance away. Rich lowered his voice. They've got to find a motive for this ridiculous accusation. They'll try to bring that there was an association between Mrs. Clayton and myself. That, as I know Mrs. Clayton will have told you, is quite untrue. We are friends, nothing more. But surely it is advisable that she should make no move on my behalf. Hercule Poirot ignored the point. Instead, he picked out a word. You said this ridiculous accusation, but it is not that, you know. I did not kill Arnold Clayton. Call it, then, a false accusation. Say the accusation is not true, but it is not ridiculous. On the contrary, it is highly plausible. You must know that very well. I can only tell you that to me it seems fantastic. Saying that will be of very little use to you. We must think of something more useful than that. I am represented by solicitors. They have briefed, I understand, eminent counsel to appear for my defence. I cannot accept your use of the word we. Unexpectedly, Poirot smiled. Ah, he said, in his most foreign manner, that is the flea in the ear you give me. Very well, I go. I wanted to see you. I have seen you. Already I have looked up your career. You passed high up into Sandhurst. You passed into the Staff College, and so on and so on. I have made my own judgment of you today. You are not a stupid man. And what has all that got to do with it? Everything. It is impossible that a man of your ability should commit a murder in the way this one was committed. Very well. You are innocent. Tell me now about your manservant, Burgess. Burgess? Yes. If you didn't kill Clayton, Burgess must have done so. The conclusion seems inescapable. But why? There must be a why. 
You are the only person who knows Burgess well enough to make a guess at it. Why, Major Rich? Why? Well, I can't imagine. I simply can't see it. Oh, I've followed the same line of reasoning as you have. Yes. Burgess had opportunity. The only person who had, except myself. The trouble is, I just can't believe it. Burgess is not the sort of man you can imagine murdering anybody. What do your legal advisers think? Rich's lips set in a grim line. My legal advisers spend their time asking me, in a persuasive way, if it isn't true that I have suffered all my life from blackouts, when I don't really know what I'm doing. As bad as that, said Poirot. Well, perhaps we shall find it is Burgess who is subject to blackouts. It is always an idea. The weapon now. They showed it to you, and asked you if it was yours? It was not mine. I had never seen it before. It was not yours, no. But are you quite sure you had never seen it before? No. There was a faint hesitation. It's a kind of ornamental toy, really. One sees things like that lying about in people's houses. In a woman's drawing room, perhaps. Perhaps in Mrs. Clayton's drawing room? Certainly not. The last word came out loudly, and the warder looked up. Très bien. Certainly not. And there is no need to shout. But somewhere, at some time, you have seen something very like it, eh? I am right? Uh, I do not think so. In some curio shop, perhaps. Ah, very likely. Poirot rose. I take my leave. And now said Hercule Poirot, for Burgess. Yes, at long last, for Burgess. He had learnt something about the people in the case from themselves and from each other, but nobody had given him any knowledge of Burgess. No clue, no hint of what kind of a man he was. When he saw Burgess, he realised why. The valet was waiting for him at Major Rich's flat, apprised of his arrival by a telephone call from Commander McLaren. I am Monsieur Hercule Poirot. Yes, sir. I was expecting you. Burgess held back the door with a deferential hand, and Poirot entered. A small square entrance hall, a door on the left, open, leading into a sitting room. Burgess relieved Poirot of his hat and coat, and followed him into the sitting room. Ah, said Poirot, looking round, it was here, then, that it happened. Yes, sir. A quiet fellow, Burgess, white-faced, a little weedy, awkward shoulders and elbows, a flat voice with a provincial accent that Poirot did not know, from the East Coast, perhaps? Rather a nervous man, perhaps, but otherwise no definite characteristics. It was hard to associate him with positive action of any kind. Could one postulate a negative killer? He had those pale blue, rather shifty eyes that unobservant people often equate with dishonesty. Yet a liar can look you in the face with a bold and confident eye. What is happening to the flat? Poirot inquired. I'm still looking after it, sir. Major Rich arranged for my pay and to keep it nice until... until... The eyes shifted uncomfortably. Until, agreed Poirot. He added, in a matter-of-fact manner, I should say that Major Rich will almost certainly be committed for trial. The case will come up probably within three months. Burgess shook his head, not in denial, simply in perplexity. It really doesn't seem possible, he said. That Major Rich should be a murderer? The old thing. That chest. His eyes went across the room. Ah, so that is the famous chest. It was a mammoth piece of furniture of very dark polished wood, studded with brass with a great brass hasp and antique lock. A handsome affair, Poirot went over to it. It stood against the wall near the window, next to a modern cabinet for holding records. On the other side of it was a door half ajar. The door was partly masked by a big painted leather screen. That leads into Major Rich's bedroom, said Burgess. Poirot nodded. His eyes travelled to the other side of the room. There were two stereophonic record players, each on a low table, trailing cords of snake-like flex. There were easy chairs, a big table. On the walls were a set of Japanese prints. It was a handsome room, comfortable, but not luxurious. He looked back at William Burgess. 
The discovery, he said kindly, must have been a great shock to you. Oh, it was, sir. I'll never forget it. The valet rushed into speech. Words poured from him. He felt, perhaps, that by telling the story often enough, he might at last expunge it from his mind. I'd gone round the room, sir, clearing up. Glasses and so on. I'd just stooped to pick up a couple of olives off the floor, and I saw it. On the rug. A rusty, dark stain. No, the rug's gone now, to the cleaners. The police had done with it. Whatever's that? I thought, saying to myself, almost in joke, like, really, it might be blood. But where does it come from? What got spilt? And then I saw it was from the chest, down the side here, where there's a crack. And I said, still not thinking anything, well, whatever. And I lifted up the lid like this. He suited the action to the word. And there it was, the body of a man, lying on his side, doubled up like he might be asleep. And that nasty foreign knife or dagger thing sticking up out of his neck. I'll never forget it. Never. Not as long as I live. The shock. Not expecting it. You understand? He breathed deeply. I let the lid fall, and I ran out of the flat and down to the street, looking for a policeman. And lucky, I found one just round the corner. Poirot regarded him reflectively. The performance, if it was a performance, was very good. He began to be afraid that it was not a performance, that it was just how things had happened. You did not think of awakening first Major Rich, he asked. It never occurred to me, sir. What with the shock, I, I just wanted to get out of here. He swallowed. And, and get help. Poirot nodded. Did you realize that it was Monsieur Clayton, he asked. Well, I ought to have, sir, but, you know, I, I don't believe I did. Of course, as soon as I got back with the police officer, I said, Why, it's Mr. Clayton. And he says, Who's Mr. Clayton? And I says, He was here last night. Ah, said Poirot, last night. Do you remember exactly when it was Mr. Clayton arrived here? Well, not to the minute, but as near as not a quarter to eight, I'd say. You knew him well? Well, he and Mrs. Clayton had been here quite frequently during the year and a half I've been employed here. Did he seem quite as usual? Oh, I think so. A little out of breath. But I took it he'd been hurrying. He was catching a train, or so he said. He had a bag with him, I suppose, as he was going to Scotland. Oh, no, sir. I imagine he was keeping a taxi down below. Was he disappointed to find that Major Rich was out? Well, not to notice. Just said he'd scribble a note. He came in here and went over to the desk, and I went back to the kitchen. I was a little behind town with the anchovy eggs. The kitchen's at the end of the passage, and you don't hear very well from there. I didn't hear him go out or the master come in, but then I wouldn't expect to. And the next thing? Major Rich called me. He was standing in the door here. He said he'd forgotten Mrs. Spence's Turkish cigarettes. I was to hurry out and get them. So I did. I brought them back and put them on the table in here. Of course, I took it that Mr. Clayton had left by then to get his train. And nobody else came to the flat during the time Major Rich was out and you were in the kitchen? No, sir. No one. Can you be sure of that? Well, how could anyone, sir? They'd have had to ring the bell. Poirot shook his head. How could anyone? The Spencers and McLaren and also Mrs. Clayton could, he already knew, account for every minute of their time. McLaren had been with acquaintances at the club. The Spencers had had a couple of friends in for a drink before starting. Margarita Clayton had talked to a friend on the telephone at just that period. Not that he thought of any of them as possibilities. There would have been better ways of killing Arnold Clayton than following him to a flat with a manservant there and the host returning at any moment. No. He had had a last-minute hope of a mysterious stranger, someone out of Clayton's apparently impeccable past, recognizing him in the street, following him here, attacking him with the stiletto, thrusting the body into the chest and fleeing. Pure melodrama, unrelated to reason or to probabilities, in tune with romantic historical fictions, matching the Spanish chest. He went back across the room to the chest. He raised the lid. It came up easily noiselessly. In a faint voice, Burgess said, It's been scrubbed out, sir. I saw to that. 
Poirot bent over it. With a faint exclamation, he bent lower. He explored with his fingers. These holes at the back and on one side, they look... They feel as though they had been made quite recently. Oh, sir? The valet bent to see. Well, I really couldn't say. I, I've never noticed them particularly. They are not very obvious, but they are there. What is their purpose, would you say? Well, I really wouldn't know, sir. Some animal, perhaps? Uh, I mean, uh, a beetle? Something of that kind? Something that gnaws wood? Some animal, said Poirot. I wonder. He stepped back across the room. When you came in here with the cigarettes, was there anything at all about this room that looked different? Anything at all? Chairs moved, table, or something of that kind? Well, it's odd you're saying that, sir. Now you come to mention it, there was. That screen there that cuts off the draft from the bedroom door, it was moved over a bit more to the left. Like this? Poirot moved swiftly. A, a little more still. That's right. The screen had already masked about half of the chest. The way it was now arranged, it almost hid the chest altogether. Why did you think it had been moved? I didn't think so. Another Miss Lemon. Burgess added doubtfully, I suppose it leaves the way to the bedroom clearer, if the ladies wanted to leave their wraps. Perhaps. But there might be another reason. Burgess looked inquiring. The screen hides the chest now, and it hides the rug below the chest. If Major Rich stabbed Mr. Clayton, blood would presently start dripping through the cracks at the base of the chest. Someone might notice, as you noticed the next morning. So, the screen was moved. I never thought of that, sir. What are the lights like here, strong or dim? Well, I'll show you, sir. Quickly, the valet drew the curtains and switched on a couple of lamps. They gave a soft, mellow light, hardly strong enough even to read by. Poirot glanced up at a ceiling light. That wasn't on, sir. It's very little used. Poirot looked round in the soft glow. The valet said, I don't believe you'd see any bloodstains, sir. It's too dim. I think you are right. So, then, why was the screen moved? Burgess shivered. It's awful to think of. A nice gentleman like Major Rich doing a thing like that. You've no doubt that he did do it. Why did he do it, Burgess? Well, he'd been through the war, of course. He might have had a head wound, mightn't he? They do say as sometimes it all flares up years afterwards. They suddenly go all queer and don't know what they're doing. And they say as often as not, it's the nearest and dearest as they goes for. Do you think it could have been like that? Poirot gazed at him. He sighed, turned away. No, he said. It was not like that. With the air of a conjurer, a piece of crisp paper was insinuated into Burgess's hand. Oh, thank you, sir. B but really, I, I don't... You have helped me, said Poirot, by showing me this room, by showing me what is in this room, by showing me what took place that evening. The impossible is never impossible. Remember that. I said that there were only two possibilities. I was wrong. There is a third possibility. He looked round the room again and gave a little shiver. Pull back the curtains. Let in the light and the air. This room needs it. It needs cleansing. It will be a long time, I think, before it is purified from what afflicts it. The lingering memory of hate. Burgess, his mouth open, handed Poirot his hat and coat. He seemed bewildered. Poirot who enjoyed making incomprehensible statements, went down to the street with a brisk step. When Poirot got home, he made a telephone call to Inspector Miller. What happened to Clayton's bag? His wife said he had packed one. It was at the club. He left it with the porter. Then he must have forgotten it and gone off without it. What was in it? Well, what you'd expect. Pajamas, extra shirt, washing things... Very thorough. What did you expect would be in it? Poirot ignored that question. He said, About the stiletto, I suggest that you get hold of whatever cleaning woman attends Mrs. Spence's house. Find out if she ever saw anything like it lying about there. Mrs. Spence? Miller whistled. Is that the way your mind is working? 
The Spences were shown the stiletto. They didn't recognize it. Ask them again. Do you mean... And then let me know what they say. I can't imagine what you think you've got hold of. Read Othello, Miller. Consider the characters in Othello. We've missed out one of them. He rang off. Next he dialed Lady Chatterton. The number was engaged. He tried again a little later. Still no success. He called for George, his valet, and instructed him to continue ringing the number until he got a reply. Lady Chatterton, he knew, was an incorrigible telephoner. He sat down in a chair, carefully eased off his patent leather shoes, stretched his toes, and leaned back. I am old, said Hercule Poirot. I tire easily. He brightened. But the cells, they still function. Slowly, but they function. Othello, yes. Who was it said that to me? Ah, yes. Mrs. Spence. The bag, the screen, the body, lying there like a man asleep. A clever murder. Premeditated, planned, I think, enjoyed. George announced to him that Lady Chatterton was on the line. Hercule Poirot here, madame. May I speak to your guest? Oh, why, of course. Oh, Monsieur Poirot, have you found something wonderful? Not yet, said Poirot, but possibly it marches. Presently, Marguerita's voice, quiet, gentle. Madame, when I asked you if you noticed anything out of place that evening at the party, you frowned, as though you remembered something, and then it escaped you. Would it have been the position of the screen that night? The screen? Why, of course, yes. It was not quite in its usual place. Did you dance that night? Part of the time. Who did you dance with, mostly? Jeremy Spence. He's a wonderful dancer. Charles is good, but not spectacular. He and Linda danced, and now and then we changed. Jock McLaren doesn't dance. He got out the records and sorted them and arranged what we'd have. You had serious music later? Yes. There was a pause. Then Margarita said, Monsieur Poirot, what is all this? Have you... Is there hope? Do you ever know, madame, what the people around you are feeling? Her voice, faintly surprised, said, I suppose so. I suppose not. I think you have no idea. I think that is the tragedy of your life. But the tragedy is for the other people, not for you. Someone today mentioned to me Othello. I asked if your husband was jealous, and you said you thought he must be. But you said it quite lightly. You said it as Desdemona might have said it, not the realizing danger. She too recognized jealousy, but she did not understand it, because she herself never had and never could experience jealousy. She was, I think, quite unaware of the force of acute physical passion. She loved her husband with the romantic fervor of hero worship. She loved her friend Cassio, quite innocently, as a close companion. I think that because of her immunity to passion, she herself drove men mad. Am I making sense to you, madame? There was a pause. And then Margarita's voice answered, cool, sweet, a little bewildered. I don't... I don't really understand what you are saying. Poirot sighed. He spoke in matter-of-fact tones. This evening, he said, I pay you a visit. Inspector Miller was not an easy man to persuade, but equally Hercule Poirot was not an easy man to shake off until he had got his way. Inspector Miller grumbled, but capitulated. Though what Lady Chatterton's got to do with this? Well, nothing, really. She has provided asylum for a friend, that is all. About those Spences, how did you know? Well, that the stiletto came from there? It was a mere guess. Something Jeremy Spence said gave me the idea. I suggested that the stiletto belonged to Margarita Clayton. He showed that he knew positively that it did not. He paused. What did they say? He asked with some curiosity. Admitted it was very like a toy dagger they'd once had. But it had been mislaid some weeks ago, and they had really forgotten about it. I suppose Rich pinched it from there. 
A man who likes to play safe, Mr. Jeremy Spence, said Hercule Poirot. He muttered to himself, some weeks ago. Oh, yes. The planning began a long time ago. Eh? What's that? We arrive, said Poirot. The taxi drew up at Lady Chatterton's house in Cheriton Street. Poirot paid the fare. Margarita Clayton was waiting for them in the room upstairs. Her face hardened when she saw Miller. I didn't know. You did not know who the friend was I proposed to bring. Inspector Miller is not a friend of mine. Well, that rather depends on whether you want to see justice done or not, Mrs. Clayton. Your husband was murdered. And now we have to talk of who killed him, said Poirot quickly. May we sit down, madame? Slowly Margarita sat down in a high-backed chair facing the two men. I ask you, said Poirot, addressing both his hearers, to listen to me patiently. I think I now know what happened on that fatal evening at Major Rich's flat. We started, all of us, by an assumption that was not true. The assumption that there were only two persons who had the opportunity of putting the body in the chest, that is to say, Major Rich or William Burgess. But we were wrong. There was a third person at the flat that evening who had an equally good opportunity to do so. And who was that? demanded Miller skeptically. The lift boy? No. Arnold Clayton. What? Concealed his own dead body? You're crazy. Naturally, not a dead body. A live one. In simple terms, he hid himself in the chest, a thing that has often been done throughout the course of history. The dead bride in the mistletoe bough. Yakimo, with designs on the virtue of Imogen, and so on. I thought of it as soon as I saw that there had been holes bored in the chest quite recently. Why? They were made so that there might be a sufficiency of air in the chest. Why was the screen moved from its usual position that evening? So as to hide the chest from the people in the room, so that the hidden man could lift the lid from time to time and relieve his cramp, and better hear what went on. But why? demanded Margarita, wide-eyed with astonishment. Why should Arnold want to hide in the chest? Is it you who ask that, madame? Your husband was a jealous man. He was also an inarticulate man, bottled up, as your friend Mrs. Spence put it. His jealousy mounted. It tortured him. Were you or were you not Rich's mistress? He did not know. He had to know. So, a telegram from Scotland, the telegram that was never sent and that no one ever saw. The overnight bag is packed and conveniently forgotten at the club. He goes to the flat at a time when he has probably ascertained Rich will be out. He tells the valet he will write a note. As soon as he is left alone, he bores the holes in the chest, moves the screen, and climbs inside the chest. Tonight, he will know the truth. Perhaps his wife will stay behind the others. Perhaps she will go, but come back again. That night, the desperate, jealousy-racked man will know. Well, you're not saying he stabbed himself. Miller's voice was incredulous. Nonsense. Oh, no. Someone else stabbed him. Somebody who knew he was there. It was murder, all right. Carefully planned, long premeditated murder. Think of the other characters in Othello. It is Iago we should have remembered. Subtle poisoning of Arnett Clayton's mind. Hints, suspicions. Honest Iago, the faithful friend, the man you always believe. Arnold Clayton believed him. Arnold Clayton let his jealousy be played upon, be roused to fever pitch. Was the plan of hiding in the chest Arnold's own idea? He may have thought it was. Probably he did think so. And so the scene is set. The stiletto, quietly abstracted some weeks earlier, is ready. The evening comes. The lights are low. The gramophone is playing. Two couples dance. The odd man out is busy at the record cabinet, close to the Spanish chest and its masking screen. To slip behind the screen, Lift the lid and strike. Audacious, but quite easy. Clayton would have cried out, not if he were drugged, said Poirot. According to the valet, the body was lying like a man asleep. Clayton was asleep, drugged by the only man who could have drugged him, the man he had a drink with at the club. Jock? Margarita's voice rose high in childlike surprise. Jock? Not dear old Jock. 
Why, I've known Jock all my life. Why on earth should Jock... Poirot turned on her. Why did two Italians fight a duel? Why did a young man shoot himself? Jock McLaren is an inarticulate man. He has resigned himself, perhaps, to being the faithful friend to you and your husband. But then comes Major Rich as well. It is too much. In the darkness of hate and desire, he plans what is well nigh the perfect murder. A double murder, for Rich is almost certain to be found guilty of it. And with Rich and your husband both out of the way, he thinks that at last you may turn to him. And perhaps, madame, you would have done, eh? She was staring at him, wide-eyed horror-struck. Almost unconsciously, she breathed, Perhaps. I don't know. Inspector Miller spoke with sudden authority. This is all very well, Poirot. It's a theory, nothing more. There's not a shred of evidence. Probably not a word of it's true. It is all true. But there's no evidence. There's nothing we can act on. You are wrong. I think that McLaren, if this is put to him, will admit it. That is, if it is made clear to him that Margarita Clayton knows. Poirot paused and added, because once he knows that, he has lost. The perfect murder has been in vain. Production Copyright 2001. All Rights Reserved. As part of our Mystery Masters imprint, the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of Agatha Christie's other Hercule Poirot mysteries, including The Mysterious Affair at Stiles, Death on the Nile, and Murder on the Orient Express. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audio books on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.